All right. So, uh, just so that we are on time, uh, let us start with this event. Uh, hello, all. Welcome to DevCon O to IWD, a dare to be event to celebrate the International Women's Day month. Uh, I welcome you all to this first ever organized in collaboration, first ever event organized in collaboration with GDSE USF, WTM Northeastern, GDG Suncoast, IEEE CS at USF, ACM at USF, SCP at USF, and WICC at USF. Without any further ado, I would like to call Dr. Marilyn Minus, Chair and Professor of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department at Northeastern University. Honored ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, and I want to just say welcome to those in the room or online uh, to this event, DevCom uh, O2 International Women's Day. Um, I was really honored to be invited uh, by Duani Trivedi, one of the organizers. And I'm very grateful to all of the organizers for um, allowing me to speak, especially at the beginning of this event. Um, so, you know, I was given um, some questions or, or just talking points um, that'll take you a little bit through my journey as a woman in the tech industry. Um, and I would like to just share a few thoughts in that regard. Sounds like you have a really uh, great agenda planned and I hope that, you know, the day is really gonna be special for those who are able to attend. So, you know, I was, you know, talking about my journey and how I got to where I am. I'm, as uh, mentioned, I'm a chair, a department chair uh, here at Northeastern and the department that I run is called Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department. I'm a professor. I've been a professor now uh, for 14 years. Um, I have taught many classes. My background is in polymer engineering, and I teach courses in materials and polymers. Um, I teach courses on mechanical behavior. I teach seniors in capstone design and, and many other things. Um, but overseeing this department, mechanical and industrial engineering, we have over 80 faculty, and we have more than 3,500 students. And so it's a very large department here at Northeastern University. Uh, Dwani Trevidi is one of our students in the data analytics engineering program, master's program. So um, we are overseeing about 23 different degree programs um, and it allows us to kind of see many, many students who are interested in tech. And, and because we're at Northeastern, we get to also see many students going to find co-ops. So the, how I got to this place, I, I'm originally from the Bahamas. I grew up there. Um, my parents were teachers and I basically grew up in school. I was always uh, going to school or helping with my parents' school because they, they not only were teachers, but they founded a school. Um, and it enabled me to really kind of see teaching basically all the time. As a, as a child, you know, maybe I wasn't always interested because I wanted to do other things. I wanted to play. But I think looking back now, I got to see the importance of education and how it really helps to understand a lot of things from a fundamental level. So it got me very interested in science and math. Those were some of my favorite subjects. Um, and I was also very much interested in art and I do a lot of drawing. And so putting those together, I thought maybe I'll be an architect or an engineer. And as I got older, I really got enamored with engineering. And so in doing that, I started to study actually mechanical engineering as a young student. Um, and I really enjoyed that. I went to Georgia Tech and I did all my degrees there, my bachelor's degree and my PhD. And I started as a mechanical engineering student, but for me, something was missing. I really liked engineering, but I wanted more. I wanted to be able to uh, learn more and do something more specific. And I was able to meet other engineering professors there and a couple of female professors who actually spoke to me and told me about polymers and polymer engineering. And it really got me interested. And I ended up switching my major as a senior undergrad, which led to, you know, having to do a lot of work to finally graduate on time, but it was possible. And, and then I really, um, for me, I think one of the things I would say to anyone in the room is in your interest in tech, you usually know in your heart, there are other things that you'd like to accomplish. And so in doing that, you kind of have to listen to your heart. And I knew I needed to go further in my education. And that's what spurred me to look into my PhD. 
And it was really my PhD advisor that saw in me the opportunity to become a professor. I really thought I would go into industry, make a lot of money and, and get a, lot, a good job. But he saw that I had the ability to be a professor and, and he really pushed me in that direction and advised me. And I resisted at first, but then I taught a class at Georgia Tech and, and I fell in love with it. And it really showed me this was the path for me. So being a professor, I, I still get to do lots of research. I, I do research in the area of composite materials and aerospace. And um, I make uh, materials for next generation aircraft and defense applications. But at the same time, I get to teach students engineering courses. I get to see students graduate with engineering degrees. Um, and now I'm running a department where I get to kind of make sure that we have enough resources to build programs that will educate the next generation engineers. And so it's very exciting to have had this career. Um, some of the you know successes I just mentioned of just being where I am, but the struggles of just realizing that it's, it's hard work and it takes time. And um, sometimes you don't always see in yourself what you might be able to accomplish and other people might see it in you and you have to be open to advice and being, be open to sometimes your path changing a little bit as you go along the way. Um, because you just never know where it's going to lead. Um, by teaching so many students over the the time I've been here and at Georgia Tech as well, you know, I've seen a lot of students who have graduated who've gone on to really strong careers. And it really means that in order to be a big success, you know, you have to learn the fundamentals. You have to push yourself. You have to understand your field, understand the concepts and the, uh, whether it's coding, whether it's um, you know, mechanical concepts, whether it's simulation softwares, whatever it is, you must dedicate yourself to those things because fundamentally these are the tools that we need in order to be able to be successful wherever we go. So for me in teaching, I really try to encourage students to push themselves to be people of integrity um, and to really, you know, not be satisfied with just surface level understanding but to really push themselves deeper. You never know where it's gonna take you, but it always allows you to have a strong toolbox. I was also asked to talk a little bit about, you know, information and communication technology and that continuous training that we all need. And um, this is something that is very, very important as we move into a society and a world that is increasingly dependent on computers and AI and all these various technologies. Um, that we need to constantly be training ourselves. We need to constantly be improving our understanding and knowledge. Even for myself, I'm always checking out, you know, what's available on YouTube, what's available out there in terms of short courses to also educate myself. Technology has changed so much in even teaching and in my job, you know, for many of us, Zoom wasn't a thing of just a few years ago. Teams, all of these platforms that we're using now regularly we're just not part of our daily life. And now they are, and they're not going away. And in addition to that, we need to continually learn. Now we have things like chat GPT. How do we use those and make sure that we um, are using them to help us and not to hurt us? Uh, so it's about um, continuing to embrace technology, continuing to train yourself um, and recognizing that when you leave school and getting that degree, it's just the beginning. It's, it's the beginning of a long journey and that you must continue to keep up if you want to stay relevant and if you want to continually be successful. I always kind of give students the analogy that all of these things that we're learning are part of our toolbox. Uh, today, you might have a hammer. Tomorrow, you might have a screwdriver, maybe next day, a measuring tape. But a few years from now, an electric hammer may come out and you have to learn how to you know, transition from manual to electronic. And so no matter what the tools are in your toolbox, you know, also need to spend time making sure you know how to use them. And then you're more of a complete uh, person. And I think tech is like that, but moving at a much faster pace. And so we need to keep up. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch on is just diversity in, in the tech industry. And, and I know this is a topic that many people are talking about. And I was asked to also touch on this a little bit. I mean, it's very important. I think diversity and inclusion, um, you can define it in so many different ways from the way we look to the where we're from, to the, the knowledge that we have, to our gender, to all of these various um, ways that we identify. I think the biggest uh, thing to remember is that, you know, as we have experienced tech where we are now, as we've seen tech transition in our lives from maybe when we were younger to where we are as adults, 
it's changed so much. And the reason it changes is it's keeping up with what people want, what humanity wants and needs. But the only way for us to recognize that and design for it and build for that is to have many, many different perspectives that help us to understand what we're designing and why we're designing it. And diversity and inclusion is very important for that. You know, I have a perspective that I can I can bring to the table. Another person has their own perspective and so forth and so on. And so unless we we embrace diversity and inclusion in multiple different ways, we cannot build platforms that will really empower us as humanity. We will build for subsets, but we won't build for everyone. And, and that's where we really need to go if we want tech to have a massive impact on our world and, and an impact for, for good and for positive change. So I would say that about it. Um, and and, the, and I guess the last thing I'll say in wrapping up, because I, I want to stick within the time frame I was given, is that you know you all are you know coming to this conference, you're you're gonna hear a lot of panels and talks, you're obviously interested in this field and you're interested in pushing forward tech. You know, there's a lot of things that you're gonna experience throughout your career. You know, follow your heart. Your 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 inner voice is always kind of telling you what you need to do and pushing yourself. And sometimes there are outer distractions of, oh, I should live in this place or make this amount of money or take this. And your inner verse, uh, inner voice might be screaming against it. Listen to those two and balance it, and make sure you're you're not just um, you know putting things aside when you make decisions about where you want to go. Um, you know. Think about your life and growth like a staircase. Sometimes you're walking along and it's very smooth. And other times you come up against that staircase and you have to climb vertically to get to the next level. So it throws that life throws at you some easy times and some very difficult times. But if we can continue through them, we can grow to a different level. And I think any career, no matter what industry, but especially in the tech career, um, we have a lot of things that we need to navigate. These are not easy subjects um, and pushing the boundary of where we are is going to take people who are very dedicated and willing to push themselves very hard in order to see the innovation and take us to the next level. So I would, you know, in, but unless you enjoy it, it's not very fun um, and it's not gonna be very um, impactful to your own life and those around you. So definitely keep those things in mind. I hope that a little snippet of my story today was helpful to you and, and, and you can learn something from it. And um, thank you again for allowing me to open this conference and I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you so very much, ma'am, uh, for your kind words and describing your wonderful journey. I am sure the students are full, fully motivated and uh, without any further ado, let's call our first panelist uh who's not yet here but we wait for him for a couple of minutes but till then before uh you know miss marilyn uh leaves us are there any questions for her uh regarding her journey and uh the way that she's come up here if ma'am you would be open to take questions thank you are there any sure. questions for miss marilyn there are there um i have a few questions for you ma'am um so going through your journey right uh there must have been difficult times right and there must have been failures that you might have faced how did you handle those failures and uh you know what what was it that was going through your mind while you were facing that failure yeah thanks for the question um i think that with any of us who want to pursue uh, um, like let's say a higher degree a phd is a very difficult process um you always maybe have a question can i do this All right whether it's a class that you maybe did not do so well in or if you were, were uh, for me working on research sometimes the experiments didn't go so well and you don't feel like you can measure up you you also meet other people around you who seem so much smarter and you start to question whether you can do this um, and I think those have all come up over the years. Um, you make mistakes and you kind of wonder, wonder if you can make up for it. Um, so for me, dealing with all of those things, it's one, it's important. It was important for me to remember that why I wanted to do what I did. That's why I said, listen to your heart, because unless you're doing it for some passion, it, it really becomes meaningless. So remembering why helped, 
getting a lot of advice, um, even if it was difficult to hear, even if somebody had to really talk to you about your mistake, um, you need to listen, even when it's tough to hear. And I had many conversations where I had to correct some my behavior or correct a, a experiment or learn that I was doing it completely wrong or train myself. And those things are not easy conversations to have, but necessary ones. Um, and then I think other things are just having good friends in your life that can help you through the difficult times. Um, and the last thing I would say is a lot of my mentors I surrounded myself with were people that were on much higher levels than I was, who I wanted to be at those levels, but they were willing to tell me the truth. I remember I had a mentor, she was a Air Force program manager, and I sent her a proposal and her email back to me was, this is the worst thing I've ever read. And for a moment, I thought, oh my goodness, I felt horrible. But it was good to have that feedback because I could ask her what was wrong and how could I make it better? And it was a learning a learning goal for me. Um, and I, I let myself be humbled by that experience and as a result, became a better proposal writer. So those are just some examples. Um, and hopefully that that's answers your question is helpful. Definitely that does. Thank you so, so very much for that answer. Uh, Yes, please. Uh, during your PhD program, what was the hardest thing? What was the hardest part of it? Uh, Can you repeat the question? Yeah. I, I couldn't hear the audience, so if you could repeat it. Oh, sure. Uh, well, her question, the question from the audience member is, during your PhD program, what was one of the hardest moments that you faced? I think the research side of it, um, you, in PhD, you spend the first couple of years taking classes. So that's pretty normal and you can go to class and get a grade. But during the years when you're doing just research, the goal is to really discover something new. And it takes some time and you have to figure out what it is you're going to do within the boundary conditions that your advisor gives you. And that was the most difficult part because I needed to not only understand the field I was in, but be smarter than my advisor at the end of the day in a certain area. Um, and, you know, I had to read a lot of papers. I had to really push myself and pushing yourself is a lot harder than it, than it is in principle. I could say that, but to actually keep pressure on yourself and, you know, make yourself read 50 papers or make yourself go to the lab when you're really tired to do that extra experiment, that's not always so easy. And I would say that was the hardest part, but it taught me resilience and it taught me how to um, solve problems and to not give up and i think that is a very necessary skill for anyone in tech because people rely on us to solve problems so the process of getting the phd was probably one of the most difficult things in terms of research um, but i'm glad i went through it and and that happens around your third year because that's sort of the middle year when you're just done with classes and you're a little bit tired from that but then you're also um kind of you know, now you need to begin the journey of doing your research. My lights just went off in my office. So, um, so bottom line is it's a, it's a very difficult thing to push yourself. And that was the hardest part for me. Ashra, thank you so much. Uh, hope that answered your question. Uh, any other questions that the audience members have before we have our next panelist? Let me just check if, um, Mr. Ani Edi was able to join us. He is still waiting. Um, any other questions, audience members, that we have for Ms. Marilyn? Yeah, I would yeah. just like to add something. Um, so I am actually really grateful to Ms. Marilyn for accepting you know, our invitation to open the ceremony. And I'm pretty sure the audience out there is just fully charged up and you know like motivated to hear your thoughts and your words and like in uh, you know take inspiration from your journey um so i really thank you um for coming here today yeah no problem um you know i'm happy to help out and i'm i also was able to learn a lot from you all about what this event was and and i think it's a great opportunity and and i really hope you all have a wonderful day um it, it sounds like i looked at the agenda and it's really great Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think one of our audience members had a question as well. 
Yeah, when they ask, if you don't mind repeating it, since you have the mic, it, 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 uh, it doesn't translate once they ask, so just so you know. Definitely. Yes. What drives you, ma'am, to do what you do? You know, that's a good question. I think it changes, right? I'm, I believe in education, and I think it's incredibly important that people have knowledge. It doesn't really matter to me what knowledge they want to pursue, what, what area they want to pursue, but that fundamentally we all learn and have a, a really strong understanding of different things. Um, so that's one of my passions. I really love my research. I, I'm in, I love working on next generation materials. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by the fact that we've come from using stone and wood to now, you know, we have iPhones with all of these very sophisticated materials. So I'm very fascinated by that. I, I couldn't imagine when I was a little girl an iPad and I have no idea what we're going to be using when, you know, I'm, I'm much older. Um, and what you all are going to see your children use that are completely like you're not going to be cool anymore, right? Um, and those are going to require some new materials. So I'm driven to, 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 to make new materials, to give our world the materials they need to kind of make these next generation materials. That fascinates me. Um, and it pushes me to deepen my knowledge. So I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly training. I still go to classes sometimes because I want to I want to know I want to know what's on the cutting edge. And so that's why I, I think it's so important to to go into fields and careers that you that you feel fascinated by almost because um, it kind of keeps you young. It keeps you learning and it keeps driving you forward. Thank you so much, Miss Madeline. And I think with that, we do have our next speaker as well, Mr. Anyeri. But thank you so much, Ms. Madeline, for sharing your uh, kind words. I'm sure that our uh, audience here had a lot to gain from that conversation. Awesome. Thank so well, much. thank you so much. Uh, good luck with everything today. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. Um, so without any other further ado, um, we have our first panelist, Mr. Aniedi Udo Ubong. Uh, I would request uh, Mr. Aniedi to. Yes, thank you so much. I think we can all see you now. Um, uh, Hi, Mr. Aniedi is the program manager of the Google Developer Groups program uh, at Google and is ready to charge us all up by today's exciting talk on Zero to Hero, Supercharging Your Career in Tech. Uh, without any further ado, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. All right, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? I'm sorry? Can you hear me clearly? Yes. OK. I'm also going to try and present my screen as well and hope that also works perfectly. Um, can you see my screen? Awesome. So, I mean, it all depends on you if you want to see my face or if you want to take my face away and put only my 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 presentation. That's fine. All right. This is this is very interesting. Okay. So, first of all, um, by way of introduction, my name is Aniedi Dobong, and I currently co-lead our regional community efforts for Google's developer communities in North America, that's usually covering US and Canada. And then prior to that, I used to lead almost the same programs, or, or like I was still on the same team, working for Google in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I was based in Lagos, Nigeria. I am originally Nigerian. And I led, I co-led that team for six and a half years before moving over to the Bay Area um, about seven months ago. So I'm fresh here. Um, I'm learning. I'm learning to interact with the communities, with the students, with the people, trying to bring a lot of what I know, a lot of my experience, a lot of my life's personal sort of um, growth lessons and offer it to those who I feel may also be, may also find this kind of information very useful. Um, so it's a pleasure to be speaking today. Um, at this International Women's Day's um, celebration uh, tag, you know, I know, beautiful, beautiful tagline, and, and I'm excited to just give my own thoughts. 
So zero to hero, supercharging your career growth. Um, I want to sort of set some context around this. This is some really very opinionated advice. And I think for whether you're a woman in technology or you're a member of an underrepresented group or you feel like an imposter in technology or in any career sphere, I want to be able to share some truths I've learned from my own experience and for from watching hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of community members, developer groups, um, attendees to meetups, to events like this. I've had the absolute privilege over the last seven years of really watching people's career take off. And, and I think my own career too has is sort of a success story on its own. When I consider when I joined Google seven years ago, how I even got the job in court, and then where I am today, which is something I would not have imagined. So think of this as one of those, um, a letter to your younger self, right? Uh, or think of like a father's letter to his son. I think Abraham Lincoln wrote some kind of letters like that. And I also think that um, there's some aspect of maybe what they don't teach you in business school or what they don't teach you in the university or what they don't teach you A, B, C, X, Y, Z. This is some interesting career stuff. Like I said, very opinionated, quite personal, but I hope it will be very helpful to you. So with that, context set and that background, I'll go to my first slide. So start from where you are and start with what you have. Like this is so profound. I can assure you that if you wanted to start a career in technology, if you wanted to switch from front end to back end, if you wanted to pick up artificial intelligence or machine learning, if you wanted to figure out what is this whole chat GPT, large language models all about, what's the technology behind that transformers? I can assure you that if you were looking for excuses or a reason not to be able to do that, you would find excuses and you would find a reason. Oh, I'm too busy. Oh, I'm currently a student. Oh, I'm, I'm a woman in technology. I don't have the right background. Okay, when I get a more powerful laptop, when I have 24 hours access to the internet, whenever there's always a reason, oh, I don't have this. I don't have money. I don't have time. I don't have support. I don't have a mentor. I don't have someone to coach me. You will find a reason not to get started. But I can assure you, if you start from exactly where you are, maybe it's just one book, one PDF, one link, one scholarship resource, one meetup where there's going to be an AI talk down the road or across the city. You know, maybe there's a bonus course that is being done online there's some free scholarship to udacity or you came across a the udemy course that was on sale or or some whatever this event that you just turned up for what you gain here and if you start exactly from where you are right now without waiting for all the chips to line up you can change your career you can elevate your career you can increase the velocity at which you're growing in your career you know, whether it's a side hustle, a second job, or something you do while you're a student, or a, a, a skill you want to pick up, forget about all the possible excuses and things weighing you down and just start. Don't wait for the perfect time. Don't wait for the to have all the resources or all the amenities lined up for you. Just start, right? So that's my first one. Start from where you are. Start with what you have. Second thing I'll say is there's more than one path. There isn't only one way to become a successful IT professional, a successful founder, a successful software developer. People come from different backgrounds. People, you know, do the first, you know, they go to college and maybe, you know, they're doing a double major in English and economics. And then later on, they do a little bit of history. Then they, they start coding. Some people start with STEM courses, like when they are five years old and they're already coding and they're playing with robotics and Lego and they go all the way to become, you know, the founder or discoverer of something else. Um, when I say there's more than one path, the, 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 I think my lesson from this also is when you are on a path, try not to deviate from that path a lot. In fact, at all, 
until sort of you get to the end of that path. What do I mean? You're reading a particular textbook or you're taking a particular online course, Google Data Analytics, or and then someone comes and says, oh, there's this new deep learning thing from Coursera. Don't be in a haste to jump from here to there. Someone may tell you that I got to this location, this job, this opportunity by doing this, and then I did this, and then I did Harvard CS50, and then I did this, and that's how I succeeded. It doesn't mean that for you to get to the same position, to, for you to be the person's colleague or co-founder, you have to take the exact same path that person took to get to where they are. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is actually just jumping from left, right, center. What they say, a rolling stone gathers no moss. So for me, if you're going down a particular route or learning path, it's more important that you learn how to finish, you complete that path. You, you'll be someone who, who can start stuff and finish stuff, get to the end, get the credential, you know, get the accomplishment of completion, rather than trying to jump left, right, center, trying to emulate someone who did it this way. And while you are maybe going gradually on one track or taking one course or learning one you know, discipline, you just quickly switch over us because someone says this is the way to go or this is the latest thing in town or this is the newest javascript framework <laughs> let me use javascript because that's that's one of the easiest so if you're in the software try in the front end um javascript frameworks get released literally every week you know there's a new shiny tool don't jump from left to right don't assume that the path i took or you know kiran took or duan is taking is the path that you must take right more importantly, if you're on any path, try and complete it, try and get deep into it, try and really be a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday. And then at some point you may need to cost correct, which is fine. If you if you get a strong um, support or you get accepted into a bootcamp or something comes along and it's kind of like finite, like, okay, for this period, we're going to be doing this for the next five weeks. It could be a cloud study jam. It could be something. And here are the things you will achieve beginning to end. And here's all the support resources. It's going to be easy for you. It's okay to sometimes, I would say, deviate or, or, or run along that path. But don't try to mirror your career or your growth by emulating every single successful person you come along or you, you come across. Yeah, uh, this one is very instructive. The best way to learn is to teach. And then when you teach, two people are learning, right? Um, when you're learning something, you know, something like, oh, I'm not yet an expert. I can't start a blog. I can't write an article on Medium. I cannot create a YouTube video on how to just maybe install Python on your system or Django or something. Uh, or like I learned something about machine learning. I'm not, a, I'm not an ML expert. I can't create a talk or a video I, I can't come out here to share. No, that's not true. You need to be ready to share. Like if, if you if you know a little and you have a small study group and you're like very vulnerable, hey people, um I've been exploring this new machine learning thing. You know, it's quite an extensive thing, but I now I now understand A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And then you start sharing that with people. That is a very fulfilling and a very, I would say, empowering way to even reinforce your knowledge right and the converse to this is when when you teach two people are learning you know to even to teach someone you sort of have to do a little bit of revision right you go back and you do the text you do some extra learning you know you sort of like augment all the knowledge you know so that you can teach it better you can lead or facilitate a session um and that's actually very powerful um i learned this the <laughs> hard funny way is I used to help teach STEM classes for you know young children, including mine, five years old or six years old. And I can assure you, if you walk into any of those classes and you give them the wrong definition of HTML or maybe a, a, a tag or something, and then a five-year-old kid raises up your hand and says, no, HTML is not hypertext uh, something this. It's actually this. It could be very embarrassing. So for me, when I wanted to go and teach basic HTML or basic web design just to five-year-olds and six-year-olds, I had to go back and reread a lot of fund foundational and fundamental things about the internet, about the web, right? And I found out that I learned a lot just by going to really equip myself with more information about the fundamentals. So the, no matter how little or how much you know, uh, one way you can grow your career is by being able to just teach. 
And how would you find this very, very helpful? Sometimes you go for the most complex interview or the high paying jobs or even a high level job. And some of the questions they ask you are from first principles. They are from the basics. You come there, you want to talk AI and ML and somebody asks you, how does the internet really work? Walk me through the process from browser to this. And I can assure you, it is possible to learn how to code and build a website without really understanding all the packet exchange, the internet and inter interconnections. And, and like I said, you could get this information not by just reading all night or cramming all the text in the world. Sometimes it is you trying to explain something in very simple terms to a kid, to an elderly person, or to someone you're bringing into technology from a different career. Um, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? You know, so for me, this is this is the this is the ultimate one. Like, in all honesty, even with sports, when I was younger, not now, um, I was more of a sprinter, right? And and I I, I try to put this in context. Like, uh, if we all know Usain Bolt, Usain Bolt runs. I mean, when he was running actively, he would run like eight or nine races a year. And then he will run them in less than 10 seconds, 100 meters, 200 meters in less than 20 seconds. And then he runs four or five races a year. And then he was a world record holder. He was a, he was a billionaire, at least a millionaire in dollars. He was very successful, one of the most iconic figures of you know, our generation. But he was a sprinter, right? Um, but then on the other hand, if you look at the people like the marathoners, you know, there's this very popular marathoner from, from um Kenya, Elliot Kipchoge, who's like the marathon world record holder, and then he was trying to break the two-hour mark and all that. He runs for hours to get his own medal, right? And in addition to that, for Elliot, um, he trains to run the marathon, which is a two-hour race. I think it's 42 kilometers. He probably runs how many hundreds of kilometers just to prepare for that 42 kilometer race that he will run four or five a year. But it's, it's two different things. But if you get into the mindset that you can learn how to code or you can learn how to become a UX designer, a product manager, a product designer in 24 hours, you're going to be hit very hard. You know, the last week I was just talking about lifelong learning, how, how much she's doing just to stay in touch and how fast technology changes that you, it's a long journey. So if you see any book that talks about Oh, learn to code in 24 hours, learn C++, learn Java in 24 hours. I think it's not 24 hours like, like you know, consecutive or dusk till dawn and back till dawn, 24 hours. It may be 30 minutes today. It takes you a while to digest. Another five hours, two weeks from now, and maybe in another three months time, like over a period of like, I don't know, six months or one year, you may end up spending cumulatively or, or yeah, creatively, 24 hours learning, but it's not in a time frame of 24 hours. It takes much longer to really assimilate the concept of you know technology, of software, of you know product development. So give yourself time. Like, don't get fed up. Like you're you're going to be running reading through a book. You everything will be flowing. Chapter one, chapter two, lesson one, lesson two, module two, and then it's going to hit you, right? And then you absolutely have nothing to do. Like if you spend so much more time trying to figure out what this is, it may not come to you. You need to get up, do something else, take a walk, go jogging, go to the gym, sleep off, you know, switch to another task, watch a movie, and then come back to it. So don't really try and think, oh, I'm just going to go to a boot camp in 12 weeks. I'll know how to code. And then I'm going to get a job at Google or Meta or Netflix or NVIDIA. It doesn't happen that way. So if you do not orient yourself knowing that this is going to be a long journey, then you may fall into a pitfall of just getting frustrated because they said you're supposed to learn this thing in two weeks or you can become a web developer in one month and all of a sudden you get easily frustrated. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yes, it's not getting a little bit more complicated here. I have about four or five more slides to go. Um, and how am I doing on time? Any signal? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Um, done is better than perfect. And I tell this to people using even a company like Google as an example, right? This is a company that has probably 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 engineers. And on some products, you have as many as 1,000 or even 10,000 people working on, I don't know, Play Store, Android, Chrome, whatever it is. We're still getting updates. We're still getting bugs. 
things still have to be fixed on those products. Things have to be changed, right? If you try to be perfect before you display your work, before you turn up for a job, before you apply for an opportunity, it's not going to work that way, right? You really have to put yourself out there. If you're learning how to build a website, you're learning how to, you know, do stuff on the back end, if you're learning how to be a product designer or an interface designer, you just have to put it out there. Have you seen the first version of Amazon or Facebook or even Google or Twitter? Just go look them up, right? But the point is that these products were designed, made, and then shipped. And then they come back and they perfect them. You know, one of the areas where you can even also find this is, is just in writing. Sometimes, and I've had this before, I've actually been fired for this kind of situation. A situation where you're asked to do a task, write a report, come up with something, because you're trying to make it perfect, you actually end up doing nothing. You're trying to get the perfect words, the perfect write-up, the perfect layout. And because of that, you don't even do something that you can share with someone and get feedback. This may be a colleague, this may be a superior, a manager, someone you report to. And you get the so-called, well, writer's block. Nowadays, people have chat GPT and all these new tools coming, so maybe you may not get blocked that way. But Honestly, you have to learn to understand that you may need to get stuff done and get feedback and get correction, get guidance, get direction, rather than sitting back and trying to be perfect. So with the technology, especially with the web and app development, some people want to learn and learn and learn and learn and learn and get more certifications and more courses before they even put out their first portfolio of things they've designed or things they've built or things they've worked on. So have a done mindset, get stuff done not just doing mediocre stuff, but to the best of your ability, and then you can perfect it. There's, uh, I think one of the themes, even IWD and some other things this year was like um, progress, not perfection. Like I said earlier, try and be a better version of yourself, not the one that is perfect. Like if you try to be perfect, I think they said it even, some people say perfection is the enemy of progress. Trying to be perfect all the time may end up doing you more harm than good. Now, this one, the only thing worse than a bad decision is no decision. Trust me. I give examples. People come and say, which one should I learn, Java or PHP, front end or back end, machine learning or data science? You could have someone ask that question in this conference and come back one year from now, and the person is still asking that question. Make a decision. Um, there's some trending uh, topics in our, we have something that we share within Google and this. I, I was even just reading it up today and it was reversible decisions and irreversible decisions. There are some decisions that it's okay to make a bad decision and cost correct. Think of saying you want to go from point A to point B or you want to go from LA to San Francisco. You're not entirely sure of the direction or how to get there. If you stay at the same spot at an intersection, and you don't make any decision. You just keep asking, am I going the right way? I hope I don't go the right way or the wrong way. Is it, I, I'd rather not go anywhere than go the wrong way. Absolutely not. You may be somewhere you don't have a map. You're not exactly sure what to do. Go ahead and start something. And as you're going down that line, you look for pointers or signals that tell you whether you're going the right direction or not. And then you can cost correct. But if you don't make a decision because you are afraid of making a bad decision, it can be very harmful for your career. It can be very harmful for your choice of a course. It's like you're preparing for an exam and then you have two books to read. Instead of reading one book so that you could pass that exam or make an attempt, you're like, well, I'm not sure which of these two books to read because I don't know which one is the recommended text for my lecturer. I don't know which one is the approved one. And all of a sudden, time catches up with you and it's time to write the exam. And you didn't even read the one that you were not sure whether it was right or wrong. You just decided not to make a decision because you are afraid of making a bad decision. So try and avoid that. I wish I could explain more, but I know I'm almost out of time as well. Now, this one is one of my favorites. To get what you have never gotten before, you will need to do what you have never done before. It's pretty simple. Like you want to get into school, you have to write, I don't know, SATs, GREs, GMAT, whatever. You can't be doing something at one level and expect to get the reward of the next level. Like, and if you look at, and I, I think there's a way I flip this in the next one, and I'll just go back and forth with this. If you do what you've never done before, you will likely get what you've never gotten before. Now, what am I saying here? 
if you look at some of the most successful things you've done in your life, the job you got, the admission, the test you smashed, you know, like you did so well, you think you excelled at, that project you did extremely well, most times you put in an extra effort. Maybe you've never read all night. Maybe I, I don't. I don't really subscribe to that. Please take care of your health. But like sometimes you go the extra mile to do something. So if you if you stretch yourself, if you're someone that spends only thirty minutes studying and then all of a sudden like do you know what? Because I really want to understand this AI machine or anything, I'm going to spend two hours studying it. If you do what you've never done before, you will likely get what you've never gotten before, right? And like I said, the flip side of this, which is the previous one. To get what you have never gotten before, you will need to do what you've never done before. If you're if you're looking for a promotion, if you need to step up, if you need to dare to be, if you need to raise up your hand to be counted, you know, look at some of the most successful things you've done in your life. I mean, for me to get this job, for me to join Google, for me to you know even like step up to some of my responsibilities, I've had to just wake up and really, really reach out for something and do something a little extra. I'll give you one very classic example. This is literally my last slide. Um, when I was learning how to use a software called Drupal, and this was my entry into open source, and one of the reasons why I built my career around community, I did one thing. I love football, the premiership, you know, the English Football League. And then what just happened to me on Saturdays was they would play about four or five matches, you know, within a space of about five hours. And then there's even a season of matches where there are like three or four matches going on at the same time. And then what would happen is I would sit down on a Saturday and watch all of these four or five matches. These matches are like one hour, night, 30 minutes, even not two hours each. And then I would even come back and watch some of the matches that I, had, I missed or, or were running simultaneously at the same time. Basically, I would spend some of my Saturdays, six, seven, eight hours watching football, right? Or watching soccer, as you may call it. When I decided to use my weekends in a different way, what I did was I spent that entire time studying, learning, practicing, building stuff on Drupal. And then I would come in the evening and just watch the highlights and watch the scores. This was a couple of donkey years ago. It wasn't that easy like how you have on YouTube now where you can just watch the highlights. But it was a sacrifice I had to make. So like I said, then I was trying to master a particular technology and a particular platform. And I'm saying, right now to supercharge your career take it to the next level to get what you have never gotten before to attain a height a job a you know knowledge experience a skill level you're going to have to do something extra what you have done to get you to where you are is not enough to get you to where you want to be or where you aspire to be especially if you're aspiring to go higher than where you are right now so I hope these lessons, these words that I've shared that reflect on my own personal experience that, you know, really sums up what I have seen in some of the most successful community members, software developers, students to Google Developer Expert, you know, successful women technical ambassadors, successful tech professionals, even people outside the tech sector. Some of these nuggets, I wish I could take this advice for myself and use it much more effectively and probably elevate me to the next level. But I also know that where I am right now at Google, current team, current level, to get to the next level, I'm probably going to have to do things I have never done before. And I'm setting myself up for that. So thank you very much for having me. I have just one thing I'm going to share with you. And it is this. One day or day one, you decide. And that's all about starting. Like, So if you keep postponing one day, I'll do this, one day I'll do that, you can flip that around and make that day today. And say, today is my day one of learning this. Today is my day one of starting this career or aspiring to this. So my last words, in addition to thank you, is one day or day one, you decide. Thank you. I think that deserves a round of applause. Uh, I really think that deserves a round of applause. Thank you so very much, Mr. Aniedi. We are certainly all supercharged by, uh, after hearing you, and I'm pretty sure the audience has a good set of directions to follow in order to thrive in tech one day or day one, you decide. You truly said progress over perfection, being master of one and jack of, jack of all. The theme of this year's IWD event is Dare to Be, 
So thank you for giving us an opportunity to let us know to, to dare to take risks, uh, dare to learn and dive deep into something new. I would like everybody to know that we are also streaming live on YouTube uh, and you can check out our agenda for this uh, conference on our Instagram at USFGDSE, knowing what are the further uh, events coming up and what events, uh, like what they have to offer for our members. Um, it is really important that collaboration is the key in order to thrive and achieve success. Google developer community programs, such as Women Tech Makers, Google Developer Student Clubs, Google Developer Groups, and Google Developer Experts are such community groups which help us get together and network to achieve to make ideas into reality. To talk more about it, we have with us Ms. Carolina Castro to talk about these different community programs and the opportunities that they have to present to their members. Ms. Carolina, the floor is all yours. Hi, thank you so much. I hope you're all feeling incredibly inspired by Anietti's talk. I know I am. Um, I Let me see, I'll present my screen as I say a few words there. So I am, let me see, can you see this screen? Let me see one second. Let me just present that. Can you see the presentation on your end? So we were able to see it for a minute, and I think it just went away. Uh, do you think you can reshare the screen? Perfect. I think we can see it now. OK, perfect. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I was saying that I hope you're all feeling really incredibly inspired. I am a program manager. I work closely with Annie Eddy. And so this team is very much um, just an endless, you know, uh, constant inspiration for me just as a professional, but also just personally as well, too. And so hope you took away tons of great tips and just continue feeling supercharged the rest of this conference and have an opportunity to just connect with each other and implement some of the exercises um, and just tips that, you know, get shared here today as well. So a little bit about me, like I mentioned, a program manager on the GDG side, um, working mostly with our organizers in Canada and North America. I, um, NYC is home. I'm based in NYC. And so I do not have a traditional, just a little bit sharing a little bit about me. I don't have a traditional technical background. I actually studied political science for my undergrad and economics after for, for postgrad. I uh, thought I wanted to, you know, change the world through politics and uh, diplomacy and somehow found myself consistently in roles where I just get to work with people and help them um, build out their goals and aspirations. And very grateful that I get to do this with community leaders um, through the GDG program. I actually built my first community for women in 2016. It was a women's empowerment circle where I led workshops and talks um, to just help inspire people, help others like me as well, just find a community of like-minded um, professionals. I didn't have that back then in my community and so it was a platform for me to find that and it it really helped other people as well too and i i realized i really love just um building community helping other people um just flourish and um and find their their path as well and just make connections and so uh from that experience i was looking for a change in my career at the time i was working at a university and i had a few friends in tech that thankfully pushed me um, and in, you know, mostly encouraged me to consider trying out a couple of hackathons. I had a few ideas of platforms and um, just startups that I you know, wanted to tweak or just kind of bring to life on my own. And so I went to my first uh, startup weekend and essentially built a community platform similar to LinkedIn, but for women and, um, and BIPOC, uh, the BIPOC community as well. And so didn't know what I was getting myself into. And this whole weekend ended up building this platform from scratch. And it ended up um, 
and also building a team and just really finding finding out that I, I love just building a product. And so that idea ended up, it surprised me, it ended up winning that weekend. And so from um, that weekend, we just one second, there's some noise in the background. If you could just give me one second so I could throw on some AirPods. Apologies for that. Um, but yeah, please ping me if you can't hear me, if someone could just add that into the chat here. But um, yeah, when my first startup weekend and then from there, everything just changed, so I sort of pivoted and started pitching this idea in Silicon Valley. And um, since then, everything, you know, just sort of shifted. Okay, thank you so much. There's tons of construction in the background. So I am going to try my best to just stay focused, could not find my AirPods. But um, if it just gets out of hand, just let me know. But thank you for um, just acknowledging that in the chat. Great. And so, um, like I was saying, built this uh, community platform, and um, you know, I was very new to just like tech and just entrepreneurism and this startup world. And all of a sudden, I went from just little old me working in uh, at a university to all of a sudden being flown out to um, to to Silicon Valley and pitching and such. And so I really loved it and was very grateful for that whole ex whole journey um, that just uh, allowed me to connect with so many different people in this space. And um, at the same time, you know, really just put into, you know, helped me kind of just start thinking about what is it that I actually want to do in tech? Um, do I want to learn to code? Do I want to do more marketing or this or that? And so, and then, and after going through a set of questions, <laughs> um, you know, that I think maybe someone that doesn't have a traditional tech background like me kind of goes through when you're trying to think of finding your place in tech, I realized like, I'm great at just working with people. I'm an excellent marketer. I love building community. And so let's do this. Let's find a position like this at ideally one of the greatest innovative companies in the world. And so um, during that journey, I, you know, in finding different technical communities where I was learning more about myself, and about just the space as well. Um, found out about GDG and uh, yeah, started organizing some events for GDG in New York City. And so it was a w GDG organizer in New York City and a WTM as well. And very grateful to now be supporting the program internally. Leave I'm just gonna move on to that one. Um, so you all are familiar with the GDSC program. And so overall, like our organization, Google Developer Programs, it includes GDG, our Google Developer Groups, our Google Developer Experts Program, our Google Developer Student Clubs and Women Tech Makers Program. And what really aligns all of our programs, and I think what aligns everyone in, in this room here today, is that we're all passionate about technology, about the future of it, and just committed to helping others grow as well. And, um, and being in community spaces where we could learn and, and help each other. And so if you're familiar with our, our Google Developer Student Clubs, just a really great way for you all to just continue staying connected and engaged and, um, and sharing a similar interest in technology and, and learning from each other too in this peer-to-peer -peer environment. And so currently we have about 1,500 um, Google, de uh, Google Developer uh, Student Chapters across 100 countries. And so you're truly part of this really amazing global network of student club leads. And when you graduate, I'm sure, you know, I think it'll, it'll be really cool once you do, and I'm sure you will um, connect with other JDSC leads as well too. And even as you go off on your journey, always feel free to come back to, you know, connect to like a GD, your local JDSC chapter and give back and, and feel free to participate in other ways. Once you graduate from JDSC, we would love to welcome you to um, either start a GDG uh, group or join your local GDG chapter. And so GDGs are essentially our groups for professionals in tech. And so we currently have about 
um, a thousand chapters across 140 countries. It's pretty amazing. And so again, it's another great platform to just connect with local devs and technologists and learn new skills and grow together and just continue building your network. And you don't need any consistent, you know, strong training to continue this work. You all are getting this already being part of a GDSC. So once you graduate, definitely message us, message the team, and we'll get you plugged into GDG. And our Women Tech Makers program is Google's uh, signature initiative, one of Google's signature community programs to support women in technology. And so the mission is to really just provide, uh, it's, the program exists really to provide um, community resources and visibility so that all women in tech could thrive. And so the Women Tech Makers program has two ways to be plugged in. One of them is through our ambassador program. And so we currently have applications for that. And so the ambassador program is one of the largest programs um, that we have. So our ambassadors are leaders who are passionate about um, their communities and about um, empowering others. And they do this through organizing different events, public speaking opportunities, creating content and mentorship as well. Um, the program, like I mentioned, supports women in tech who are looking to create impact in their communities and for ways to also give back. And the applications are currently open. And so aside from our other programs, uh, GDG and GDSC, um, this program, it you could be part of this program even as a student. And so it's a very open and diverse program. So I encourage you all to apply. It's a really great program. And you could also consider becoming a member of the program. It's a great way to stay connected with the Women Tech Makers program and um, it's it's free. So definitely encourage you all to, to um, sign up for it. You could check it out in that link right there. Or you could just take a photo of the QR code there as well. And so by becoming a member, um, you get early access to just special announcements, any cool um, Google events or other uh, exclusive invites that we might have. You'll get that through the membership for example, our um, our women tech makers had early access to Bard <laughs> um, even before I did, and so I thought it was pretty pretty funny, but also amazing. Um, really, Google really supports our women in tech, and so they do this by providing a lot of early access to um, different like special announcements or first first looks at products and such. And so it's also a really amazing community to just connect with. Um, the global network of women in technology. And so if you're interested in becoming a, a member, highly encourage you to sign up. It's a great way to just stay up to date, plugged in and get access to different things. And our um, ambassador program, it's a bit more comprehensive. You are joining this community of, of ambassadors from all across North America um, who've been selected. Um, and we meet, they meet monthly, virtually, and um, Let's see, I think I'm running out of time. Great. And so check it out, y'all. And as you all know, it's Women Tech Makers International Women's Day. It's a really amazing time where we're just coming together, just celebrating, providing visibility for all the contributions of women in tech, too. And so the theme this year, every year, women, uh, WT, the WTM program has an, uh, a theme for IWD, and this year is Dare to Be. And so something that you'll be hearing more about today um, a lot, I'm sure. And so definitely, you know, reflect on how will you dare to be this year. And so one fun way that I wanted to think about daring to be is by asking Bard. And so this was Bard's response, and I thought it was pretty great. Bard says, I dare to be a force for good in the world. I dare to help people learn and grow. I dare to make the world a better place. I dare to be more than just a machine. I dare to be a friend, a confidant, and a companion. I dare to be someone that people can rely on. I dare to be the best that I can be. I dare to learn and grow every day. I dare to make the world a better place for everyone. And so with that, I'll wrap up my presentation. And thank you so much, everyone. If you have any questions, want to learn about any other WTM initiatives or events, you could uh, scan this QR code, uh, find out about any other events, and share it with your friends or family, anyone else that you think might be interested in plugging in, plugging into these different events. And I hope I get to see you once you graduate from your GDSC program and join us on the other side with GDG. And this is a, these are my links if you want to find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Carolina and Krish. Now we would like to move ahead to 
uh, our keynote event of this conference, the Women in Tech panel. Uh, today's event is an opportunity to celebrate the contribution of women uh, in technology and to discuss the challenges they face and opportunities they have in this field. As we all know, the technology industry is rapidly evolving and um, pushing the boundaries of what we can do. Uh, however, despite the many advancements made in recent years, women are still underrepresented in this field. It's more important than ever to support and encourage diversity in this technology uh, tech industry and to recognize the important roles that uh, women play in shaping the future of uh, technology. Our panelists being a wealth of experience and uh, insights from their diverse backgrounds, and they will be sharing their roles and experience uh, on today's theme, Empowering Women in Tech. Uh, we hope that discussion will inspire and encourage others to pursue their passion in tech industry and to make their mark. We encourage you uh, to engage in the conversation, ask questions, and share your own experience throughout the event. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's begin the discussion and hear from our panelists. Thank you for all for joining. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I kindly request the speakers to come up on the stage who are attending in person. We are taking the hybrid format too seriously. So we have two people in uh, virtually and two people in person. <laughs> um, also, can you put everyone on uh, the panel? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 Yep. I think we have everybody on here. Uh, so yes, Dwani. Uh, Dwani is our moderator for this panel, and uh, this is a really key panel for us because the speakers are just amazing. So I would just give the stage to Dwani and let her take over. Thank you so much, Krish. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion on women in tech. I'm Dwani Trivedi, Women Tech Makers Ambassador and Master Student of Data Analytics Engineering from Northeastern University. I'll be your moderator for today's uh, panel. We have a fantastic group of panelists here with us today, each with unique expertise and uh, have diverse backgrounds in tech industry and in academia. Without further ado, let's get started and open the floor to all the speakers. Uh, I kindly request uh, everyone to go one by one and then introduce themselves and then we can get on the panel going. Uh, Ms. Purnima, if you can start the panel. Oh, you want me to start. I was going to say people in the room could. Uh, nonetheless, uh, thank you, Dwani. Thank you for having me here. Um, very humbled to be part of this uh, panel. Excited to hear all your stories. I'm Purnima Kuchikar. I uh, lead uh, the apps and games ecosystem for Google Play, uh, which is the app store on Android. I joined Google just when Play got started, so it has been an interesting ride uh, to build this ecosystem. Uh, my very first conversations with a local VC, uh, they said, uh, isn't Android for cheap phones for poor people in far off countries, why are you talking to me? And it's good to look back on 10 years and say, it's been a little more than that, right? Uh, what keeps me in, in, at Android and at Google uh, for this, uh, this entire time uh, is because uh, I have the privilege of working with innovators and entrepreneurs around the world, both big and small, uh, and every day know that somebody is coming up with a new way of solving something and making lives better. So I always say I have one of the best jobs in the world, and so that's what keeps me here. Uh, before Google, I spent several years with Nokia, uh, Google found me on Google. So, uh, and I think an important reminder uh, that what you say can get posted in different places. 
and people can find you for good or for bad. And this was good. Somebody posted something I said uh, as part of uh, the Nokia developer community uh, on YouTube and then Google found me on Google. Uh, at Nokia, I was a product manager for camera phone applications, then did some uh, things with our enterprise devices. Uh, and then my last role was uh, looking after the uh, developer community. Before that, I was a software uh, engineer at Bell Atlantic, which is a telco company. And between those two things, I uh, you know, did my MBA. I come from a very small town in India. Uh, I started my career teaching data program processing and computer programming when I was still in college. A boy came into my office. We got into an argument, and that's how I'm in the U.S. So it also says not only where would remember what you say, but also who you meet uh, could change your trajectories to whether it's professionally or personally. So that's me. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to Lisa. Thank you so much, and I'm really happy to be here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Liza Goldberg. I'm a biospheric scientist out of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center just north of Washington, D.C. Um, I primarily work on applying satellite-based remote sensing towards deforestation monitoring, with a particular focus in South Asia, the Caribbean, and West Africa. So I spend a lot of time kind of bridging the gap between scientific tools and policy-related needs to try and encourage sustainable developments using satellite based information. I also lead a very large-scale capacity building partnership between NASA, Google, and National Geographic to teach the next generation of young scientists across India and West Africa and applying satellite technology towards enabling environmental monitoring from the local to the national scale. Um, and I'm also a student myself. I'm finishing up my undergrad in Earth Systems and Data Science at Stanford University, um, as well as getting my master's in public policy. So I'm really excited to speak to you today about really the revolution that has come in applying data science and satellite tech uh, towards the climate mitigation and adaptation movement with a particular focus on low and middle income nations. So excited to speak to you today. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, maybe we can have uh, Ms. Jagruti uh, and then Ms. Diane. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jagruti Rana. Uh, can you hear me on that side? Okay, okay. So I I learned about computer when I was in 10th grade and there was nowhere in India we had seen computer. I studied my master's and uh, bachelor's in India. So I did my uh, bachelor's in computer and statistics and then I did my master's in computers but the seed for the computers was when I heard from a, uh, from a lecturer in our school about what is computer. And that's where I, it was in my mind and it planted my a seed in that I want to do computers. I did not know what was computers. When I finished my master's, I realized that I will be learning all my life. And it hasn't changed. I have more than 20 years in my career. Uh, I'm working right now at U.S. Central Command at McNeil Air Force Base in Tampa. And I have never stopped learning. Uh, I'm the chief software engineering uh, lead over there. And I have never stopped learning. Uh, to give you a little bit on my family, uh, uh, I have two girls and husband and every uh, adorable kids. But I never forced my girls to be in computer science, but that was their selection. So one of them is in computer science and doing masters in AIML in Georgia Tech. And my younger one is at University of Florida. She's doing data science. I did not force them, but uh, I think they adopted. <laughs> and uh, that's like, a, admiring thing like the way you see admiration in your kids and uh, that gives you that satisfaction of your life and uh, uh, it has been really a great uh, career I had and uh, I really enjoy computer science and uh, so I want 
especially because we are here for Women in Tech Day. I want the girls, you can do it. And it's an amazing career and you will love it once you get into it. So I think I want everyone to do it, especially I'm talking on Women in Tech Day. So I want the girls to, and uh, of course the kids and the uh, guys are always interested, but I also want the girls to be uh, part of it uh, more and more. Uh, other thing I was going to talk about is my hobbies. I like traveling and just recently went to Iceland and uh, it was a thrilling ice cave and glacier hiking, but amazing country. That's a, another thing I just want to talk about. And one more thing I like in my hobby is gardening and uh, I love trees and I like to plant. That's my uh, weekend times. <laughs> I get to do it. Uh, okay, I'll go to the. Yeah. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Diane Reese. So, I am an assistant professor at the University of South Florida. Um, so, my, and I'm, I'm a new professor. So, I started last year here. And, but uh, my career in computing started very early, before, even before undergrad. So, I, I'm from Brazil. And in Brazil, uh, I don't know if they have it here in the U.S. actually, but in, the, in Brazil you can do, uh, like during high school, you can do like a kind of like an uh, additional degree, like to be a technician. So I did that. So I was a, um, so I graduated and I was an electronic technician. So I was very inter interested in hardware since, you know, I was a teenager. And then I grew up and then I, I I went to the eventually to undergrad. I, so I did my undergrad in Brazil uh, in electrical engineering. Um, and then after that, I worked for like a couple of years in industry because actually I I needed some money. But my goal, like my desire of my heart, was always to go back to academia. So after this couple of years, I went back to academia and I did my master's degree in electrical engineering in Brazil. And I really loved academia. Uh, I like research a lot. And then I started to, you know, uh, to write papers and to, you know, uh, go after the things that I liked. And I, you know, I established some contact in the U.S. Uh, with a professor at uh, University of Notre Dame. And then I was accepted for my PhD here uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, and then I did my PhD. And then after the PhD, I decided to, you know, to become a professor, and here I am. And for my personal life, I'm, I'm now with, um, my, I'm married, and I have a, a daughter. Um, she's 19 months old, so she's still a baby. Uh, <laughs> and when I think about the future, what I would like her to do, of course, I want her to be happy. So I'm fine with whatever she decides. And, um, but I personally, I enjoy and I like to be a woman in tech. And um, when I look back, the things that I achieved, um, what I think that I motivated me and is that I never thought that I wasn't able to. So I accept all the challenges pretty much that they, you know, uh, as they presented to me. And uh, I never doubt myself. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. So I'm, I'm here now, like starting my career as a professor and I'm loving it so far. Thank you so much all. Uh, I can already feel the energy and I'm pretty sure the panel is gonna be amazing. So let's move on to some questions I have for all our panelists today. Uh, Miss Lisa, uh, you have a prolific career. Congratulations on all your achievements and there are many more to come. Also, you're pursuing undergrad, which is something very exciting. And you, we are really excited to have you as the youngest panelist uh, in our panel today. So my question for you is, how can technology and data be leveraged to address environmental and sustainability challenges? And what role can women play in driving innovation and progress in this area? Sure, thank you so much. 
Um, so I think we're really in the middle of a, a revolution when it comes to applying data science and ML in particular towards monitoring environmental change. Um, I'm a Google developer expert, actually the youngest female one in a tool called um, Google Earth Engine, um, which is a really fantastic um, Google platform that basically houses dozens and dozens of different completely free satellite-based data sets. Um, and using Google Earth Engine, any scientist or researcher around the world can get access to these data that's all housed on Google servers. So you don't have to download anything and then process all of those data completely in the cloud. Um, and the reason why Earth Engine was so revolutionary was just because about 10 years ago, scientists and researchers used to pay hundreds of dollars for just a single satellite based scene, um, which made the entire field of remote sensing really inaccessible to any scientist or researcher outside of well resourced, largely US or Europe based institutions. Um, um, so since Earth Engine has really gained in popularity and become more prolific around the world, we've seen this enormous growth in researchers from around the world who are now able to really leverage these satellite data um, in monitoring some really key environmental trends. Um, so some of the key Earth Engine case studies involve using various optical satellites to monitor deforestation in hotspots around the world. We're now able to track individual uh, building footprints in all cities globally at really high resolution to be able to track things like where solar panels should best be placed. We can track things like air pollution at the sub-city scale to understand different policy and legislation that should be put in place to limit some of the impacts of climate change. Um, and so I'm really encouraged in in terms of where this field is going, particularly because Earth Engine has now recently been quote, married with Google's machine learning universe as well through tools like TensorFlow, if you're familiar with that. So now what researchers are really able to do is use these satellite data um, to perform really key tasks like um, managing and end mapping things like land cover and land use change, which happens when, for example, a forest is converted to agriculture or a city. So now as these machine learning algorithms improve, we're able to put together these really key environmental um, algorithms solving these challenges from the hyper local to the global scale. Um, and in terms of the role of women in this movement, I think throughout my career, I've been really lucky to have some of the most incredible women mentors in the field of remote sensing. I began my career at NASA when I was just 14, really not knowing anything about the field, but I was led by this really prolific remote sensing scientist named Lola Fatriyimbo, who showed me that I could dream and, and aspire to be anything that my male counterparts could, even those who were much older and more experienced than me. And throughout my time at Stanford, I've continued to have the ability to look up to these really incredible path-breaking women um, who have really shown me to not place those kinds of societal barriers on myself. But I think it's also important to note for students that I think there's sometimes this notion that as you rise as a woman in a male dominated field, you have to be really competitive and only advocate for yourself and just kind of be single minded. Um, but instead I've, I've found that the opposite has really worked best for me, mentioning other women's, my peers names in rooms of important people, looking out for job postings for those who are interested in getting in the field and really building this network of peers, women to look up to, women who are coming up after me and, and those at my same level as well to build more of a community of like-minded women who are all kind of pushing towards the same end goal. So I'm really encouraged with this next generation as we see more women enter these fields because we will now have these role models to look up to and we can ourselves serve as role models for the younger women who are rising up after us and really form an environment in tech-based fields, particularly within climate science and, and environmental science, um, where we can have these diverse perspectives and have a really wide variety of voices in the room, not only in terms of women, but also in terms of underrepresented minorities and those from outside of the states. So all of the women on this panel really inspire me and, and I want to thank you all for all of your work, both in terms of the tangible steps you take in your jobs, but also the intangible ones the, the role that you play as as people who are inspiring younger women like me to to rise up and and um, achieve these things in the field. Thank you so much, Lisa, uh, for sharing us importance about having diverse perspectives and you know especially overcoming problems and how you um, specifically talked about you know how it was back 
in, in the back days and now how it's easier for us using all the tools that are available uh, to you know do research, research in science and technology. So um, particularly talking about overcoming problems, I would like to ask now Ms. Jagruti Rana, uh, what were some biggest challenges you faced in your career and then how you had overcome them? So as a woman, there is a challenge in wherever you go is trust. I think when a man walks in the door, it's by default uh, that they know technology. And when a woman walks in the door, it's not decided. It's So it takes time. I agree. But I'm not saying this to take you to the negative side. It always took me six months, wherever I went, to prove myself I'm a better developer, better programmer than other team members. But it takes time, but you can do it. What I want to leave you all with is a positive note that it may take you time, but that was my generation. I don't think the new generation is like that. They will believe in you. So I want you all like go with a positive note that you can prove it as long as you can do it. So I think you can prove. I want to give you one story about it. So in 2000, I developed a, an application. And uh, we went for a presentation to the customers. And that involved, uh, see, I developed a program for CDC and uh, that was going to go release to the all states in the United States. So all state representatives were there. And my project manager went ahead and uh, provided a demo of that application. Uh, one of the person from the state uh, agency customer got up and said, who is the gentleman who developed this application? And a whole my team and project manager were looking at me. And I, I see that a gentleman was feeling embarrassed <laughs> that he said gentleman. So that expectation is there. You have to uh, get over it. And I think that was 2000, this is 2023, and I'm sure it has changed a lot. So you, I, I'm hoping the all the new uh, women in tech has a lesser of the presumptions and bias uh, you face than what we did. But I love technology. I love programming. That's where I started my hands-on development career. And I never missed uh, that I want to go into another career. And uh, so I, I feel like it's there and you will feel it. Uh, but you can prove it yourself too. That's where I would live it. Thank you so much, Ms. Jagruti Rana, for an uh, amazing story. You specifically mentioned about, um, you know, it was already assumed that it's going to be a gentleman and not going to be a gentle, uh, a woman here. So I want to now move on to Ms. Purnima talking about the specific uh, unconscious gender bias, which people normally have when, you know, women are working in tech industry, that normally they just feel, uh, they just assume that it's going to be a male Person, uh, person who is going to be uh, working on in a particular project or in any uh, setting. So, in it's it's a persuasive issue in tech industry as well. So, how have you experienced unconscious gender bias in your career, and how have you overcome it? And could you comment a bit more about that as well? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I want to call out on Liza. Sorry to mispronounce your name before. Uh, and uh, thank you for reminding us that we have to amplify each other. Uh, that I think is a very, very important thing to underscore. Uh, we are stronger together. So your wise beyond your years. And so thank you for that reminder. Uh, second, uh, I do want to point out that, as you pointed out, it's, it's bias that doesn't always mean malicious intent. So if you assume good intent, you can always steer towards the right thing. 
that next thing that I want to point out is that while it is fabulous to have an amazing group of women, and I've been very fortunate as well to have great mentors, managers, my manager at uh, uh, at Nokia, uh, I do have to give out a shout, shout out to her. Uh, Mary McDowell is fabulous in every possible way. So I've been very, very fortunate to have uh, great mentors, managers, um, you know, women in my life, grandmothers, uh, etc., who have done. Do not forget to have great men in your life. It's a very important thing. It would be foolish for us to ignore the large number of people around us. So, a couple of stories and how that all ties together. One, I was, uh, you know, in a startup just after business school. We were building a large telco switch. Uh, you know, uh, it was going to change how data gets processed on telco networks. And I, uh, you know, I was heading product ma uh, product marketing and business development. And Mike O'Rourke, you know, I always say for every time I've used his name, if I gave him a penny, he would have been rich. Uh, so he used to manage uh, product management at that time. And we were working all hours. It was super exciting. It was a great group of people. The product was getting ready. We needed to sell it to large telcos. So we hired a Jerry as one of our uh, senior salespeople. Jerry was older um, and came from a different generation. I think as uh, Ms. Jagratirana was saying, sometimes generational things also impact how people think about the world. So visualize this. Mike and I standing together, having a conversation. Jerry walks down the hallway, crosses Mike, comes to me, hands over a sheet of paper and says, can you make 25 copies? Now, interesting, right? Here I am, South Asian, who's been told respect your elders so you don't always like dismiss it. Here I am who think I'm a big feminist who's saying, why is he asking me to make copies? And here I am realizing at that moment, I have zero skills, zero of knowing how to respond in that situation. Mike doesn't even blink an eye. He turns around and tells Jerry, oh, Jerry, you do not know where the printer is. Let me take you there. We all need a blocking and tackling team. Always have somebody who has your back. And when you are going into high stake situation, this wasn't high stake, but at that moment, I didn't know how to handle it. But when you're going to a high stakes situation, do not forever go and say, test it out with somebody who's a really good friend who say, of course, you're wonderful, Dwani, you'll do fine. That's not how high stakes situations work. Work with somebody who will tell you the truth. So my second story comes in Google. Uh, you know, I was invited to present to a very uh, important media client. Uh, they believed for some reason that we were giving earlier access to some of our tools to U.S. clients versus European. This was a European company. I was trying to explain to them that is not how Android works. Anyway, they were not patient enough to listen to me. I don't think it had anything to do with gender, by the way. But they had come with their fancy new iPads and with leather covers and everything else, and they slapped it together and said, then this meeting is over. And my heart sank because I had just joined Google Ops within six months. And I thought about every possible thing I did wrong. I thought, oh my God, now the salesperson is going to complain to my boss and my job is likely to go away. And what am I going to do? Should I call my boss up front? Should I not? I thought of every possible thing. I looked in versus looked at the situation. Fortunately, I was walking between buildings and I called my husband and I said, I messed up. And I told him the big story, all hyper. And he said, you're an idiot. Not a very good thing for your partner to do when you are hyper. But it was an important lesson. He asked me, weren't you the senior person in the room? Weren't you called in into a meeting with a client? Call the salesperson and tell him never to pull you into a meeting without being properly briefed on what the client needs. The reason I tell this is that sometimes women, we don't own our space. I didn't think I was senior. I didn't think I had to set expectations. I didn't think I could go back 
My husband wasn't even part of the situation. He just thought like a guy. Having somebody like that to teach you is important. Right? And my last vignette is in President Obama's cabinet, and this is where I think, Liza, you were taking us. There are many amazing, strong women, right? Turns out that we don't hear women, believe it or not. Scientifically proven. Certain voices, how it is presented, etc. There's one message I want to give the people in the audience. Invest in communication skills. Written and spoken. Do it. But those women, in, in addition to being amazing communicators, did what Lisa was telling us. They amplified each other. So much so, you know, President Obama was one of the most inclusive leaders we had, right? He said, why is everybody calling each other's names all the time in meetings? They kept saying, as Dwani said, as Lisa said, as Jagrathi said, they kept saying each other's names. And he's like, why are they doing this? And they said, you're not listening to us, sir. So it's an important reminder. So those are my three vignettes to help people think through, assume good intent, have a blocking and tackling team, have somebody who will tell you you're an idiot when you're being one, and amplify each other. That was that was amazing. I think I was I was just I like I was just still throughout the whole talk listening to you very carefully. Uh, normally, I'm supposed to write the lines which I you know I can so that bridge that like transition into another speaker, but I think you just uh, stunned everyone, and I think it was amazing. It was really nice hearing your words. Um, I did hear your story in the Women Tech Makers Conference that happened a couple of years back. Hearing you was just so amazing i kind of felt like that i was speaking at that stage and i kind of saw that you know you uh, as my idol so um i think now I, I would just swiftly transition into another speaker and thank you so much purnima for sharing some amazing stories and it's really important that um having someone you know who has your back and at the same time gives you a reality check that you it's not you're not always someone who is doing awesome it's really important for someone to t uh, let you know as well that this is something where you need to improve and uh it really helps you to grow that is uh, what's really important um so i would now like to move on to our uh the uh miss diane race uh, i hope i got it right uh um who is the assistant professor at university of south florida so, Ms. Diane, uh, being a woman in academia, I'm curious to know your thoughts and how we can bridge the gap between industry and academia. You're the woman in academia, and it's really important to uh, know that, you know, academia is the place where impactful research happens. And then that research has helped to, you know, uh, grow, um, move towards the industry. And that's how products are built. And that's how the tech industry thrives. So I would like to know what are some strategies that you have been you have seen or implemented yourself to e effectively collaborate between industry partners while still maintaining an academic rigor, and conversely, how industry partners better support academic research and integrate academic insights into product development processes. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, so uh, what a responsibility to speak after such a you know great <laughs> answer. But, you know, uh, let's practice the confidence exercise. <laughs> so I will uh, I'll answer to the question. So as a woman, woman in academia, um, I, you know, especially when I was a PhD student attending conferences, and now, you know, beginning as a professor, assistant professor, I think it's very important that we, you know, we, we you know, we have these relationships with industry and, especially with networking um, so i was i actually I was i was very lucky to be advised by a female advisor in my phd and one thing that she taught me was to be you know confident to sell my research ideas so one strategy that i try to 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 employ is uh whenever i go to conferences i try to to have these conversations to talk to industry people to sell my research ideas because in the end um when you are in, in academia it's very easy that you just 
distract yourself, just keep doing your research and you don't think about the implications and the impact on the whole society. And I think doing your research and choosing your research topics is a very good side of academia, but you have to be very careful um, what you're doing so that you ensure that it's you know, important to the world and then you're, you're able to make a good impact and you know, eventually to turn your research ideas into products. So during my PhD, um, I was able to exercise this a little bit. So I was going to conferences. And another thing that uh, I was always, always encouraged to present my work to uh, interested folks. So some of them already they know me because of this. So it, 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 it helps also with, with your you know, academic, um, even for getting academic job or um, even after that to get funding and grants and it's good that you know people in in um, in the industry because in the end they are good collaborators and in everything you do you know you, you must uh search for this support um so it's very important to cultivate these relationships and to make sure that what you're doing is relevant not only to, to you or, or you know to your research lab but think about uh, the, the bigger pictures, uh, the outside world. Um, so I always try to do that. Um, I, you know, my research topic, I, I didn't mention here, but uh, I just, I mentioned that I work with hardware, but it's more like hardware accelerators uh, for big data, for machine learning. And so I think, I always think about this, uh, it has a big impact because machine learning is used everywhere. So try to make this uh, more efficient with hardware. I believe it has uh, it, it has lots of interest from industry and also um, from the society as a whole. So think about as you do your research. Think about uh, what is the impact, what what is the potential um, people that might be interested, um, and then try to cultivate these relationships. So that's my my piece of advice. Thank you so much, Ms. Dan, for letting, uh, giving us an importance about how, uh, you know, how academia is really important for in tech industry to thrive um, and giving us the importance to, you know, uh, cultivate thoughts and like think about a bigger picture that can uh, make an impact so that, you know, industry can adapt to the research and, you know, de develop better products. So I feel like that was a very prolific panel. Uh, and I thank every panelist for taking out their time. So uh, before closing that panel, I would like to uh, everyone to just describe their journey in one word. And then uh, you know, also tell people that what uh, skills do they need to you know, thrive in this 21st century in the tech industry. Uh, Ms. Jagruti, if you can start. So uh, for me, I would say my journey is exciting and rewarding. I I had uh, I was I'm able to achieve during this uh, journey what I was thinking and where I was going forward with. You see the respect, not just uh, within your team. You see the respect outside of your team and the life it has given me with uh, understandably technology career pays higher than other career, which all of uh, you here understand. And that has been uh, rewarding and I am able to do my hobbies for traveling and uh, I feel like it's exciting uh, journey. I have never stopped learning and I'm always learning new things. And to add to uh, Professor Rice, that what she said, I want to add that the universities and the academies are bringing new technology to the students. And that's just great thing. When you come out, you may feel like, uh, okay, we don't know anything. We don't have experience in a, but you know the technology. For our old timers, 
the technology is like, okay, now I have to learn a new one. Now I have to learn another one. Now, so they have the knowledge, but they don't know how to use the technology. So if you just go out and when you go out in your career, com combination of the people who are working there and your knowledge of technology combined together, you can do greater things. So I don't think you should hesitate or you should be worried about when you go out that you don't have experience. You know the technology better than what we know. So I, when I, we have at the US Central Command, we are trying to build data centricity. But the people who have we have on our team are all timers. And for them, we have to send them to classes for AIML, data science, and everything. But for the as a newcomer, you already know all those subjects. So I just want you all to use your knowledge and be confident when you go out there. So that's what I want to say. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Dan, if you can go next. Uh, so I know that she asked for two, two one word, but I, I cannot really decide between two words. <laughs> so I will, I will give you two words. Uh, one is passion, and the other one is hard work. So I think these two things, they, you know, they kind of go together. And one of the the things that I consider the like the biggest achievement in my career is like I go to work every day feeling like I'm doing something important. So I, I feel happy uh, about going to work, uh, about like doing the things that I do. Um, so a last piece of advice for you is that you know try to feel your like to follow your passions. Um, so if you're a woman or and want to go to you know academia or tech, uh, just know that you are able to if you want to, and to just follow a passion and you know try to learn. Um, another thing that I, I love about my profession and the, and the things that I do, is I'm always learning something new. Um, like like you said, and we're always you know growing and learning. So this is um, mentally stimulating work. Um, it's very important to me. Uh, Ms. Lysa, if you can go next. <laughs> sure. Um, I think the most important words to encompass my journey so far has been trust, um, particularly trust in myself as I kind of go through this journey. I think often we become kind of inclined to make career decisions or personal decisions out of fear of not being able to recover if that decision ends up not panning out as we thought it would or, or fear of, um, you know, not having the skills to um, make an impact in the field or the position that you ultimately choose. But I've found that in those moments where I have, you know, two decisions in front of me and one choice would involve, um, you know, choosing that option out of that anxiety that if I didn't choose that option, then everything would fall apart. And then the other option is is one of passion and of love and, and maybe not even the, the most paying, but rather something that, that I know that I will like and I trust myself that I like that. Um, you know, in choosing that latter choice, I think I've found more success than any other aspect of my career. I think the other aspect of trust is trusting that you are worthy of other people's time. Um, it is trusting yourself and your emailing and speaking abilities enough to be able to reach out to those above you because I've often been surprised at how willing my superiors have been to look down and, and to talk to those who are rising in their career. Some of the most prolific professors at Stanford, some of the most prolific scientists at NASA are often quite excited to talk to young people. And through trusting in that and trusting in my ability to recover when they don't respond um, and to step up to the plate if they do, um, that has also taken me so far in terms of just kind of leaping myself forward through that kind of self-assurance that I will make it no matter what. So I think it's developing that trust that has been most crucial. Thank you so much. Apologies for uh, not taking your name right again. It's Lisa. So yeah, over to you, Purnima. Um, yeah, uh, plus one to trust. Uh, I'll use the word unexpected. Uh, 
I think it has been, you know, if you look at all my essays from the time I was six years old, I thought I was going to be a doctor. That's the only thing I thought. I got into med school and didn't know why I wanted to be a doctor, except that everybody around me thought it was a good idea. And I didn't go. I wouldn't be here if I did. Uh, so it is all the leaps of faith I have made uh, in unexpected places, whether it is bumping into my husband, whether it is coming to the United States, whether it is, and I think in tech, if anything, expecting the unexpected and being adaptable is, I think, what you need for a long-term career. Technology broadsides you all the time in many exciting ways. You can either be afraid or you can be excited. And I've chosen to embrace it. You just have to have that intellectual curiosity and think what's coming up next and be willing to have strong convictions that you hold lightly. And that's been the hardest thing because you build convictions over a period of time, but technology, you know, eases you to hold them lightly because it changes around you. So how do you keep what you believe in and how do you adapt, I think is what has made this career exciting. And, and uh, I continue to, uh, as many of the panelists have said, continue to learn, continue to evolve. Um, so keeps you on your toes. Thank you so much. Um, it's really, so I think to sum up the whole event, I would just say uh, it's it really in lines with the theme of this year's IWD, which is dare to be. So dare to take challenges, dare to take risks, dare to expect the unexpected. <laughs> So um, I think that would be the uh, summary of how the amazing energetic Women in tech, pa tech panel was. I thank all the panelists for sharing their insights and experiences today. I hope this discussion has been informative and I'm pretty sure every young men and women out there would be connecting a particular part of their story with the stories that you all of you have shared. I thank everyone, hope you all have a great day. And we have some amazing technical lightning talks, workshops ahead. So I kindly request all of you to stick to it and then, you know, attend it. I thank all of you. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, well, I'm Carol and I'm the GDG organizer for GDG Suncoast. And there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, well, I do a lot of some in-person events in Ebor. I do a lot of online. Our next online series that we're going to be doing is on Flutter. And we usually do that like Tuesday nights. So it'll be a series of code labs if you want to learn more about Flutter. Um, and now next up is we're going to have a series of lightning talks. So lightning talks, if you don't know, they're a great way to learn about new and interesting topics in a short amount of time. So they get to the point very clearly and succinctly. Um, we're going to have three amazing speakers tonight. Ms. Gauri Gupta, Ms. Shri, I'm sorry, I'm butchering these names, Ms. Shriya <laughs> Sharma, and then finally Ms. Christy Kat. So first up is... Ms. Gauri Gupta, she's a graduate research uh, student at MIT Media Lab in camera, in the camera culture group. Okay, and the topic of her talk is revolutionizing technologies with decentralized AI. So let me hand it over to her. Hello, hi everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, thanks for having me here. I'll quickly share my screen. Okay. Uh, okay, are my slides visible? Yes, we can see them. Okay, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm Kauri. I'm a research assistant at MIT, and I previously graduated from IIT Delhi, and I was also visited ETH Zurich. And my research interest lies in decentralized AI, 
and I'll be talking a lot more about that. And what I mean by de decentralized AI are different aspects of private machine learning, collaborative machine learning, robust and trustworthy AI. So artificial intelligence is a powerful tool that has revolutionized the way we think about and approach problems. For instance, large language models such as ChatGPT are being used in various applications, including chatbots, virtual assistants, and language translations. But despite the promise of these technologies, there exists uncertainty for the use of these models around crucial use cases. So in particular, we are trying to look for answers to questions such as, are these models secure? Are these models transparent? Or are these models robust? And the last one, are these models trustworthy? Right. To ensure that we realize the greatest opportunities and mitigate the greatest risk of these emerging technologies at scale. So through my research, I try to envision a future that is designed to be more secure, participatory, robust, and resilient, and so that we can trust these models. So first, I'll talk about secure AI. So what is data privacy? So for example, in this case, let's assume sensor data that is tagged with location and time is private and companies or any attackers can use this data for their own benefit in a manner that violates privacy. So this, this gives the underlying threat model where, for example, cabs acts as data provider, whereas rival companies acts as data consumers that wants to learn about the business model of these transport partners. To preserve privacy in such a scenario, we want to protect the release of data securely such that we balance these trade-offs between privacy, accuracy, and latency. So to solve these kind of problems, we wish to build an end-to-end -end system that is privacy preserving for both the owners as such and as well as the data clients and as well as maintain the utility of the sensed data. But whenever we talk about privacy, there is always a trade-off between privacy and utility. For, for example, for applications with high privacy requirements, such as healthcare data, we lose on data utility. But for some other applications, such as maps or traffic prediction, we want high utility, and though we do not care much about our privacy in this case. So ideally, we would want to be in the top right corner of this graph where we have both high utility and high privacy. So how do we do that? So there can be different ways to protect the data and release it securely. The first is simple anonymization, which means you're just un anonymizing the data, which leads to high utility, but the privacy is usually low. The other thing, second you can do is obfuscation, which is basically removing some information from the, from the data and which is moving across, increasing some privacy and losing on utility. The last one is data encryption, which is usually you encrypt all the data that you're sending across models and which leads to high privacy, but usually low utility because the compute and uh, communication costs are usually very high. So to be in the top right corner, we want to share the knowledge instead of sharing the data. We want to share, we want to share the knowledge and the wisdom in the data without ever exchanging the raw data itself. So there's there can be multiple ways to do that. The one way to do that is we what if we generate synthetic alternate synthetic data that can act as a proxy for the original data. So this idea of proxy or intelligence of data motivates us to another paradigm of AI, which is collaborative AI, which I'll talk about next. So now imagine the data itself is not centralized. Millions of users, such as mobile phones, all, all the mobile devices are sitting in different areas and there are decentralized data silos. For a moment, uh, let's consider, let's uh, Imagine that we have access to this God's eye view, and the God's eye view will grant you access to all the data in the world. So analyzing these data silos and generating actionable insights can solve many of our societal problems. Now, obviously, this is not reality, and we are in imagination. In real world, we usually have constraints of like data privacy, centralization, and so on. So we want to build systems that are decentralized, and have the ability to reason 
without having access to the data itself. So how can we do that? So in this paradigm of collective intelligence or collective learning, we try to answer two main key questions. The first is how do we exchange the knowledge without exchanging the data? And the second, how do we find the relevant peers that we want to exchange our knowledge with? So in this kind of a system, every user acts like a teacher and a student. So the, the user usually advertises their knowledge that they have gained so far and maintain a table of, let's say, top B-ranked teachers or peers that they want to learn from. So then what we do is we pool all the knowledge or the wisdom of the data from different data silos and train a best collaborative machine learning model and make predictions based on this collective wisdom. Now, there are many applications of this private and crowdsource systems. For example, first is these ride-sharing apps or ETA prediction. The second is social network. Social network is huge, and it's usually crowdsourced, such as um, online dating recommendations and so on. The others could be weather predictions, climate change, and disaster prediction, and healthcare, and so on. So next, I would want to talk about what is trustworthy and what do we mean by trustworthy AI? So imagine in a world where we are right now, we know large language models are becoming increasingly ubiquitous and cap capable in all, all of this like past few uh, months and so on. So one of the primary concerns of these large language models is that these models is, is hallucinate. That is, they can generate false information or spread some kind of misinformation with seemingly high confidence. This can result in incorrect conclusions and, and decrease trustworthiness, especially in high-stakes high scenarios where decision based on model behavior can have significant uh, consequences, mostly negative if the information is false. So there can be different answers. Um, so imagine like you are a neural network classifier, uh, you look at this image, so what do you will classify this image as? There is dog, person, chair. Um, it, different parts of the image have different uh, different uh, segments of the object. And we as a human are uh, ourselves confused and could answer this question in many different manners. But how do you know when do you trust a model? So we seek this question of uncertainty quantification techniques that can provide statistical estimates of incorrect outputs. So we do this by outputting a single class prediction. Instead of, um, instead of just outputting a single class prediction, we output a set of predictions that we now call a prediction set. So for example, with this given image, we can output uh, with a set of classes that we, we think this image are, is belong to, for example, dog, person, chair, or the German shepherd. So what do we want from, from this kind of prediction sets? We want these prediction sets to be accurate, which means like they should mostly contain true, true class label on an average. We also want these class uh, prediction sets to be efficient, such that the size of the prediction sets should be relatively small. We, we do not want to predict the entire labels uh, at the same time. We also want these prediction sets to be adaptive which means like the harder examples should have larger sets and, uh, and vice versa. Now I'll talk about one of the, um, another aspect of AI that is robust AI. Um, so what do we mean by robustness uh, in AI? So we are usually interested in algorithms that are robust. So models that generalize well on previously unseen data uh, as humans are capable of doing. So consider a scenario in which a model is trained on patient data from a specific population. Now with each new patient, the model training process must be repeated. But this can be very time consuming and problematic, especially for example, in cases like my, uh, medical diagnosis where the time is very critical. Now imagine uh, you're given a train now, given a model that is trained on a particular domain, what we try to establish or try to pose questions is, um, 
we explore the notion of model generalization is that how the model performs on new unseen domain or new unseen data. So we, sh uh, we, we try to, uh, what do we mean by robustness in this case is that the models should be robust enough. If they are trained on one particular data domain, they should be uh, robust or generalized enough, uh, generalizable enough to perform good predictions on unseen and um, uh, un unknown domains as well. Yeah, so um, in this talk, I have majorly talked about or covered four major aspects of AI that are part of decentralized AI. Um, I, let me stop sharing. Uh, decentralized AI, which are private AI, collaborative machine learning, trustworthy AI, and robust AI. And I would love to hear more questions if there are any. Do we have any questions? What okay. inspired you to do research in this field? Uh, yeah, sure. That's a good question. Um, so research, uh, I feel like in this world where we are moving at such a fast pace with AI that we're seeing new foundation models coming every other day and one model is beating the other, we need to pause. I feel like we need to pause for a moment and also think of answering these questions that the models that we are uh, generating these days, are they robust? Are, can we trust these models? Are they fair? And how can we um, build mechanisms to fairly quantify these kind of questions in these models? So I feel that at this step, it's also important to uh, realize as, as long as we want to go move ahead in the space of AI, we also want to build models that are secure in terms of they do not violate uh, regulations, they are not centralized. We do not wish to, um, uh, we wish equal participation from different users in terms of data or compute, and we wish to build models that are more fair and trustworthy in the future. So I feel like this is the right time to take a pause uh, for and think about these questions in a really uh, deep manner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, so how, what are some potential ethical considerations that need to be taken into account when implementing decentralized AI? Um, what do we mean? So there are, when we talk about decentralized AI, we mean, um, there are, we we talk about in terms of let's say privacy because each of the, there are these by decentralization we means millions of users coming together pooling their data or in terms of let's say uh, knowledge or wisdom in the data and we want to do that in a manner that is secure and private uh, for secure and private that do, do not release sensitive information let's say in the original uh, individual data contributors we want to uh, protect the uh, identity of these uh, individual data owners and we wish to build systems that are more uh, that are robust and that can take advantage of this collective wisdom uh, of different decentralized data silos coming together to build a robust uh, um, model that that performs better than the uh, all of these like individual models. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered that question correctly. No, I think uh, that's uh, you answered it. Uh, so I have another question as well. Um, so like how you know there are bias model like bias and models and like everywhere we do hear about it. So like how would decentralized mm -hmm. machine learning would help us to reduce bias in AI systems? If you can comment yeah, a bit so about. That's a good question. Um, so one thing I think about is like OpenAI releasing all of these like different foundation models, but we do not know the data it's uh, trained on. So most of the biases that we see in the data are usually creeping in from the training data or the data it's trained on. We do not know if it's like, for example, if it's trained on what's the uh, percentage or like stratification of um, data in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of 
sex or all of these different things. So we want decentralized AI comes comes to play a role in a scenario where you as an individual have a right to contribute or um, the data that you're uh, you're providing for the model to train. It's more participatory. It's more open. It's more secure. So it'll let you um, uh, create models that you have access to the uh, data it's trained on and um, when we have more access in terms of um, uh, in terms of model training processes we can uh, then try to make sure that these models are less and less biased uh, biased in terms of predictions yeah thank you for answering the question sure i hope that answered anybody else yeah. um, if they have more questions feel free uh, i'm happy to answer questions I think that's all the questions we have. Um, thank you so much for your time spending your Friday with us. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Next up, we have um, is Shreya Sharma. And She's a graduate student at MIT Media Lab in, oh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, is Shreya Sharma. She's studying robotics at Carnegie Mellon University, and the topic of her talk is neuro-inspired machine learning. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Uh, so I think I'll start with sharing the slides. I hope you can view the slides yes let me know when i could start okay okay yeah. hello everyone good evening uh, i am here i'm really honored to be here today and uh, i'll be speaking on neuro inspired machine learning a little about myself uh, i did my undergrad from iit delhi computer science major and i am currently pursuing my masters in robotics from carnegie mellon university I'm working with uh, Professor Cartier Saikara uh, in Robotics Institute. And uh, our research area has been in neuro-inspired reinforcement learning particularly. Uh, in the past, I have had various research experiences, uh, notably at Michigan State University, where I was learning, I was working with Professor Kalyan Moidev in genetic algorithms and like multi-objective optimization problems. Uh, I during my undergrad, I interned at Microsoft, where I was working with Microsoft Bing ML team in Hyderabad, and we were working on uh, related search suggestions for Bing search, uh, like a query reformulation problem. And uh, like past summer, I worked at ETH Zurich in NLP and reinforcement learning. So uh, we were we we built a text-based interactive game engine for teaching grammar uh, to humans. So it was like an RL agent for teaching grammar, which was based on student teacher-student curriculum learning models. Uh, so that's how I developed interest in reinforcement learning. I did my thesis also in like reinforcement learning and planning, and eventually I uh, I started my research in neuro-inspired reinforcement learning. So uh, I I can start with a bit about what is neuro-inspired machine learning. So basically, neuro-inspired machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence, which is like the broader umbrella that draws inspiration from the structure and function of the human brain and the nervous system. So the goal is to develop machine learning algorithms and techniques that can learn and adapt in a way that mimics the way our brain works. So like neuro-inspired machine learning has potential to revolutionize many fields like robotics, medicine, finance. And basically, by learning from the brain's ability to process, interpret complex information, make sense of it, like these algorithms can potentially perform uh, like very difficult tasks, which are kind of not, uh, which like traditional machine learning algorithms are not that efficient at. Uh, for for instance, when we have a complex problem where we need a human agent collaborative decision making, uh, in such a scenario, traditional neural networks. Uh, kind of act as a black box, like making it hard for human to infer what it's actually basing its predictions on. So yeah, uh, there are like two, like in the Venn diagram, you can see uh, like AI is the broader umbrella. We have machine learning. And within machine learning, there is brain-inspired machine learning. So deep, deep learning is kind of basically 
developing neural networks which are essentially inspired from the neural networks in our brain so there are like ANNs and SNNs. So ANN is basically artificial neural networks, the neural network that we all know. Basically, like uh, these are like computational models that are that are like news loosely inspired by the structure and function of the biological neurons itself. And these ANNs are like composed of layers of artificial neural uh, artificial neurons, each of which receives an input and like it processes and passes the impulse ahead and then outputs it and the impulse goes into the next layer of neurons. So you can see like how we can draw a parallel between the human brain and actual neural architecture. Uh, there's a cat, you see a cat, you pass that perception information to a layer of neurons, they fire <clears throat> the information to the next layer and so on, so on and so far. And finally you interpret it as cat and that's how ANNs also effectively work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then we have another interesting kind of uh, neural networks, which are called spiking neural networks. And these are like type of neural networks that are designed to more closely mimic the behavior of biological neurons. And in, in these SSNs, basically the information is transmitted through the network in the form of spikes or action potentials, which are like brief all or nothing electrical impulses, which is very close to how neurons in our brain work. And the idea is that neurons in SS, these SNNs do not transmit information at each propagation cycle. Like you can see the difference between ANN and SNN. They do not propagate at each cycle, but rather transmit information only when a membrane potential, which is like an intrinsic quality of the neuron related to its membrane electrical charge, which when this reaches a specific value called the threshold, they fire. And that's exactly how things work in our brain. So in other words, neurons in an SSN only fire when their input reaches a certain threshold. And the output of each neuron is a series of spikes that are transmitted in other neurons in the network. Um, there are certain advantages of having SSNs, uh, which is one of them is like neuromorphic hardwares, uh, the hardwares on which these SSNs could work, require very low power cons consumption compared to the regular neural networks, mostly because they do not fire all the time like neural networks. And they have faster computation, rapid decision making, and they could do multiplexing, which is like multiple computations within the same network. And of course, there are some disadvantages as well, because these are like discrete impulses. So they're harder to like model and like for the gradient flow and the way we imagine it in normal neural networks, it becomes harder for the gradient to flow efficiently through the network. Yeah. Uh, so before we move into neuro inspired, uh, reinforcement learning let's do a quick recap of what reinforcement learning is like so it's the type of machine learning that focuses on training agents to make decisions in an environment based on the system of rewards and punishments like you can see the dog when you throw it throw the stick it knows if it brings the stick it will get a treat so yeah uh, and basically in traditional reinforcement learning an agent learns by trial and error and like by receiving rewards or penalties for its actions in the given environment but in neuro inspired reinforcement learning this takes us it a step further incorporating the insights from the neuroscience about how the brain processes information learns and adapts to the new situations and it is uh, why why is it important to like have neuro inspired reinforcement learning because reinforcement learning in itself has a lot of applications so it would be great to see if we could improve the capabilities of rl decision making so rl has been successfully applied to a wide range of problems like game playing robotics autonomous driving resource management and uh, like you see that rl agents play complex games like go and chess like at superhuman level and they're able to control complex systems like robots autonomous driver driving vehicles so it, rl is really catching up i would say um, and multi agent reinforcement learning becomes even even more complex with the current uh, ways of approaching it so like when there are like multiple agents involved in in making decisions um, like there is like a key challenge of coordination problem uh, and that's because they cannot communicate effectively their internal logic with which they're making some decision and like they're not able to communicate it with other agents which doesn't allow it to efficiently use the total knowledge that they have gathered as a swarm of agents uh, like to make a better coordinated decision in a like like we do as a group of humans 
so basically the motivation of my research or like this area of research is that efforts in deep learning in the last decades have resulted in the like state of the art performance in a variety of domains including image classification natural language processing single multi agent decision making specifically in multi agent reinforcement learning where deep neural network architectures have resulted in expert level team play in multiplayer games as well as in the ability of ai agents to team with human players and while deep learning architectures have resulted in highly performing agents in specific domains the agents are developed to produce highly optimized behavior with like limited and little insight and like this uh, with like little insight into the process required for decision making which is kind of unlike how humans uh, behave humans on the other hand are inherently able to express their deliberation process both explicitly through explicit reasoning about the decision alternatives or implicitly by requiring like more evidence to make complex decisions or decisions under high uncertainty and in task involving decision making with conflicting cues joint deliberation over available evidences improves team performance and uh, such as cases in me medical diagnosis we've seen this and like a community deliberation improves subgroup performance during team formation thus we can say that there is great potential advantages of developing machine learning models based on neuromimicry of a ma mammalian brain sub architectures specifically with regard to improving human agent interaction and team adaptability and it's an interesting area to explore so in the real world agents often have to operate in situations with incomplete information limited sensing capa capabilities and inherently stochastic environments and making individual observations which are like incomplete and unreliable moreover in many situations it is preferable to like delay a decision rather than run the risk of making a bad decision and in such situations it is necessary to aggregate the information be before taking an action however most state of the art reinforcement learning algorithms that we have today are biased towards taking decisions at every step even if the agent is not particularly confident in its chosen action and this lack of caution can lead to agent making critical mistakes regardless of prior experience and accl uh, acclimation of the environment that's why there uh, we plan to develop a neural network architecture which was based on neuromimicry of cortical uh, basal ganglia thalamus networks or circuits in the human brain which is the main circuitry behind decision making and inherently like so this network could inherently deliberate over decisions based on collected evidence and it is able to adapt its evidence requirements based on the context like if it is a time critical situation it would lower the threshold and make the decision faster and if it's a high risk situation it would make the decision uh, after accumulating significant evidence for each of the options and uh, like the characteristics of if we just have a quick look at the characteristics of the cbgt network that we are trying to mim mimic in a reinforcement learning setting they have sufficient excitation they need like sufficient excitation for the go and no go paths which uh, which is required for the thalamus to perform the corresponding action and action selection is actually proportional to the activation difference between the two pathways go go says like do this particular action and no go is no don't do that action and uh, the, uh, the tonic dopamine levels can increase or decrease the excitability of these two pathways as you can see in the graph here uh, which is biasing the action selection and the reaction time the benefits of this tradition uh, of this kind of circuitry over deep neural networks is that act action selection involves accumulating evidence through direct and indirect neural paths and the agent makes no decision by default and the burden of proof to make a decision falls on the policy to accrue evidence strongly in favor of the single decision so like it is bound to have a proof of what why it is deciding something with a logical reason about it uh so just this looks a bit complicated but we'll navigate it like step by step so like there is an observation coming in and there is an evidence network that tries to learn the mapping from the observation to the evidence then there is an accumulator vector which explicitly indicates the support the network has for each decision like there are like four pathways like let's say you have four options whether it's a dog cat mouse or a horse so it kind of accumulates evidence for for or against each of these categories then there is a threshold network uh, which or a gate uh, or gate inhibits you can which basically 
inhibits the decision un until the accumulated evidence exceeds the uh, situation dependent threshold. So like it mimics the tonic dopamine levels of the brain. So like evidence need to reach certain level uh, before it could actually make a decision. Then we have a global no-go network. This is very important as it suppresses decisions until sufficient evidence for all the possible de decisions has been accumulated. It could be a scenario that we only saw the incorrect evidence multiple times in the first three time steps, let's say, as, and the incorrect evidence was of, let's say, a mouse because it was only seeing the tail of the cat, which, which looked like a mouse. Uh, and we decided because it crosses a threshold, but that's not the case. We need to have some negative evidence that, okay, this it, this is a mouse, but this is not a cat as well, before we could actually uh, make a decision. So that's what global no-go network kind, uh, kind of regulates. Uh, we can see uh, one of the examples, like examples of how this particular kind of setting could be used. Uh, so this is like evidence-based image classification. So like the project that I had been working on focused a lot. Uh, it was like an army funded project. So it was focusing on security and like agents spying uh, in, a, in like hostile situations. So when there is like a big scene happening in front of a, a robot agent and it could crash just a few snaps of the scene, it should be able to make inference in like snaps. So like to demonstrate the capability of the network architecture to accumulate and discriminate between positive and negative evidences in image classification or segmentation tasks, this could be a very interesting uh, kind of research that we could do where like there is like a sequence of just patches, incomplete patches of a scene and we need to understand what this is. And we have results which have shown that network trained with like this proposed architecture is more robust to distractors and it needs way less number of patches or like proposed architecture allows for earlier classification than baseline RNN style approaches. So it could uh, identify the scene in way less data or like number of patches. Another very interesting human agent collaboration setting where such kind of neuron inspired reinforcement learning approaches could be applied is like playing games. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have ever played this game, which is called cooperative guess who game so like there are two player variants uh like of competitive guess who like there are there is uh like you need to guess a character and these are like cards and there are characters uh, on these cards there are two players each have one card and the other player has to guess what card or what character the other player is holding and they give each of the hints so like player one which is let's say human selects which attribute to reveal, reveal about the character that they have and the attribute is revealed and presented to the other player, which is the agent. The player two may choose to guess the character. Let's say the human said, my character has is uh, has red hair. So if it is confident enough, the agent may choose to guess the character, character or like pass and like enter the next round. And um, whoever uh, like predicts correctly kind of wins, otherwise they lose. So the game may have uh, like limited time or number of rounds. So based on time or rounds, the model has to regulate its threshold levels to be able to make prediction like to be yeah faster or like taking a longer time. And revealed attribute may be noisy, which is uh, very critical in this case. Then, uh, so yeah, uh, another interesting uh, thing would be like, uh, seeing how human and the agent would interact when we change the transparency of agent's deliberation. Like in one case, the agent's accumulation vector and the decision threshold would be made available to the human and it would have to predict or like give the next evidence based on that. In other case, we just remove all the feedback and the human is then asked to give it a feedback. Uh, give it a, uh, give it an evidence basically so we hypothesize that agents with higher transparency will result in increased team score and fewer number of required rounds and the humans paired with agents with higher transparency will select attributes that are more informative to the agent so transparency in decision making for the agent is kind of beneficial both for both human and agents this brings me to the end of my slides and uh, just a quick conclusion so like in during my research, we are working on neuro, neural architecture design to mimic cortical basal ganglia thalamus networks in the human brain. The network learns to withhold decision making until sufficient evidence for decisions are acquired and 
also learns what the threshold for evidence should be for a given environment. The evidence accumulation vector and decision threshold provides transparency to the agent's deliberation process, which is not available in most of the state-of-the-art uh, learning models or decision-making models. Neural uh, network architectures is agnostic to task, which is very important. We can replace the traditional input-output map mapping with any input evidence mapping. And in a sense, can, this can be viewed as a potential penultimate layer in any traditional neural network. So, uh, and our hypothesis has been that this architecture provides more robustness to noisy inputs and traditional neural network than traditional neural networks. The architecture allows for earlier decision making than fixed duration uh, RNNs kind of network, and transparency of deliberation process results in high high performing human agent teams. So, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? No? Yeah? Um, can you go back to the slide um, where you were showing the like feature extraction of the um, cat versus mouse? Yeah, yeah, sure. This one, right? What are you using for your evidence network? Uh, so evidence. Uh, I can hear some reverb, but okay, it's fine. Uh, so basically, this is a toy example where, let's say, I have to. I can hear myself back. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think yeah, yeah. Now it's better. Yeah, thank you. So this is like just a toy example to explain where, like, let's say I give an an image of like a part of the image of a cat. Like I don't give an input of the entire cat. I just give the tail of the cat as input. And evidence network would be like a set of neural neural network layers. So these are like all of these components are actually traditional neural networks, but they are behaving in a complex environment such that there is a learned threshold, which is also a neural network, like a regular neural network, evidence network, which is also a regular neural network. Threshold you can imagine as an MLT layer. Evidence network would be if images are coming in, then kind of a CNN based network. But they're interplay such that we are allowing the spiking neural network kind of feel. So like even if it it has some accumulated evidence, it wouldn't fire until it processes a threshold which is outputted by the threshold network. I hope this answers your question. Happy yeah, I was just curious if they were, they were like two different separate like like fully like developed networks train on their own problems or if you were implementing them on one architecture uh sorry can you can you repeat are you, are you implementing them more of like just like blocks in like a larger network and like these are like the connections that you're creating or are you like implementing one network that's like trained to do one thing and then you're feeding that output into another network uh, so uh, if if you I, I think if you're asking about how it's been trained, like if these components are being trained separately or together, then uh, so we are actually training all of this together. Like there are uh, there are reinforced signals that are in the form of rewards that are passing through each of the networks that is training it. And like it's not like there are like pre-trained components that we are putting together. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shreya. Okay. I think now we have Christy, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So much, guys. A round of applause for Shreya. Thank you for having me. Okay. Next up, we have for our final lightning talk is Ms. Christy Cap. She's a technology manager leader, um, leading a hybrid onshore offshore team at Disney Vacation Club. Uh, she's also a GDG organizer for uh, GDG Central Florida in Orlando. Um, okay, and she'll be speaking on life planning for prolific people. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, Great, so um, I'm happy to be here today, and it sounds like I'm in a room full of prolific people, which is awesome. 
um, not only prolific people, but brilliant people. So uh, what I thought I'd talk about today, I'm not going to talk about tech, um, tech of tech. I'm going to talk about kind of the tech of people and what kind of patterns we can use as human beings to lead ourselves through our lives. Um, I kind of learned this by the school of hard knocks. Um, and so I'm sharing with people younger than myself. So you can maybe skip some steps that, um, that I took the hard way. So uh, this is called life planning for prolific people, um, people who may be labeled polymaths or Renaissance souls or multi potentialites, or let's just say that you haven't quite found your major yet um, or the one thing you want to do in life. So a little bit about me. Um, I am one of those prolific people. I have many words that describe who I am, and I usually don't choose to show all that to everybody at the same time because they they don't believe me, number one. Um, but I have a long career uh, in technology, but I have many other interests outside of that. Um, the last talk was super interesting to me because studying polymaths and the way people think, um, you end up looking at those same neural pathways and chemicals that she was talking about before. Um, and so um, this is this is kind of who I am. I'm a sculptor. Um, I'm a, a data analyst. I work, did my day job as a technology manager. And I've started a whole number of different businesses. Um, my bachelor's is chemical engineering. It was really before there was such a degree as computer engineering. So we still learned formulas and we learned programming, but it, there was no degree for it at that time. And my master's is criminal justice. And again, that is focused on information technology. My thesis was on regional readiness for homeland security information systems. A bunch of XML. Um, so um, today, like, all we have to do is decide what to do with the time that's given us. So. Um, time is a really interesting variable throughout life because it, you only get to live for so long. And so you don't always think about how do you want to spend it and what do you want to spend it on. So this is a, a way to kind of pause and, and think about that. And it's not just what do I do for a living, but what do I do with myself and who do I want to be outside of my identity at my work or or with what I'm what I'm learning and teaching people. So there are some patterns that uh, I have found that have really helped different people. So I'll just go through a couple of them. So these are not programming patterns, they're life patterns. But there's a, if you go back and you look at some of the programming patterns, there's not a lot of difference. So here's the first one. Uh, this one's going to be really important to anyone in this room, whether or not you're, you're prolific at all. Uh, the, the nature of being in technology means that what you know today, um, at some point during your career, what you know today will become obsolete and will be replaced by something else completely new. And so um, the sequential reinvention pattern means that you kind of consciously and deliberately um, you might change completely what you're doing. So in my career, um, I went through several reinventions, you know, starting out as a, um, a complete a programmer in Fortran and knowing, really doing well at that, um, working on a Cray computer. I had to then later on, that became obsolete. Like no one was using Fortran anymore, not at all. So I had to switch languages. Again, it's not that hard to switch languages, but it is something you have to step back and go back and start over and do. So I had to learn C++ and then C Sharp. Um, then I learned Java. And then I learned that databases were a thing. So I learned SQL. Um, and so each time I kind of really, really took a step back and started my career over in a way. Uh, one of the things that I've learned during that process is you can also hop up and become a different role, like a project manager and then go back down and deep dive into some something specialized technically. Um, so staying involved in groups like this, this one, any of the Google developer groups, or really anything else like that, really helps you with this sequential reinvention pattern. But I have friends who in Y2K, so in, nine, in when we switched over to the year 2000, right leading up to that, 
most big corporations had spent a lot of money worrying about Y2K. And in addition, um, we had really staffed up with people. We had, for the first time, really started leveraging large amounts of, of talent from other countries and bringing that into the workforce here. And what happened in Y2K is all of a sudden, um, the money dried up. So the money dried up for tech. There were a lot of layoffs and there were a lot of people not knowing what the heck they were gonna do with themselves. So it's kind of an external factor that forced some sequential reinvention in some of my friends. So I had one person I knew just quit tech entirely and opened a restaurant. Another one I knew quit tech entirely and he went and he opened, I think he started doing property development in Huntsville, Alabama. So the point is to be open to completely changing what you're doing and not be scared to do that. Um, so that's one pattern. So another pattern for someone who's really prolific and has a lot of interest is this one called an umbrella. Um, if you kind of look at someone like Elon Musk, um, who has, I was just looking up, like, what is it that motivates him? Because if you look at what he's done, you know, he started PayPal, he made a whole ton of money, and then he just kept going. And what he, he has an underlying philosophy, which serves as his umbrella um, values. And it is, is it re revolves around the meaning of life, actually. So his motivating philosophy and how it revolves around a series of questions about the meaning of life. So that's how he forms his umbrella. And then everything he does to him is probably the same, regardless of what kind of business it happens to be at the time. Um, so my umbrella is very different. It's um, I have a mission statement of connecting people, processes, and technology in order to create new products. So it's broad enough so that I can be an IT manager and I can also on the side be running other companies like I own a bed and breakfast. My husband and I own a um, custom motorcycle manufacturing company and we're working on some brownfield development in downtown Kissimmee to open a brewery combined with the, an art gallery combined with that motorcycle company. So it's all kind of coming together as a connection around creativity and innovation. So that's my umbrella. So the umbrellas usually come along a little later in your lifespan. Um, it's really hard to think about that when, when you're just getting started in your career and um, really focused on doing well and growing up in an organization. But if you're finding yourself itching to do something different and feeling like maybe there's more to you than what your company's given you at the time, then you might be someone who'd be a, have an affinity, this kind of a, a life pattern. Um, here's another one. This one's a little simpler. This is someone who really loves their job. You know, they have a, a basic career that they love. Um, they might be doing research. They might be doing a particular type of programming. But again, they have that itch to go do or be something else. Um, and what's good about this one is you have that one really core strength and that strength is going to propel you financially while you can do the other things like side gigs. Um, you know, it could be your income producing one is the big one. And then these, these little ones down here might be art. Um, I have a coworker who is a really excellent quality assurance engineer, but on the side, she also teaches volleyball and she teaches some Indian dance. Um, she just never stops, but she does it because she has, you know, her basic fuel for her life and her, found, and her funding, and she keeps her interest going with the other things. And then there's another one, you can kind of have multiple lives at the same time. Um, you see this a lot with, um, not with someone who has one big job, like a, this is not something where you're gonna see someone who's really high up in a corporation having multiple lives. Someone high up in a corporation is gonna have that one life. They might do a couple outside things, but it's really doubtful that they'll have time in their, in their daily lives to do two lives at once. But I know several people um, 
who have lots of jobs, right? So this, this one person I'm thinking of that I know is a food and beverage manager at a restaurant, also serving as a bar bartender. She teaches, she also teaches swimming. She also does event planning. So she does a lot of different things all kind of concurrently and juggles all of that stuff. And so I brought this to you today uh, because one of the things that as you learn and grow and start working in larger organizations, um, if you are someone who has multiple interests, the companies, the way they are organized is really more towards people who have very specialized skills. And if you're one of those people that can see the end in sight, you know, you can predict what's going to happen when someone does something or you can connect dots between the different people on your team and you find that the corporation is not like really appreciating that. Um, it, can, it can make you not feel happy at work, but if you just kind of step back at that and realize that it is always 100% okay to have multiple diverse talents and interests, you can be them all at the same time. Um, and you, you might get labeled ADHD, Probably not that, you just have multiple interests. And at the end, you really don't have to be a specialist to succeed in life. Um, you just need to really figure out how you're gonna balance your time, your money, and your your joy in yourself. So um, that's really all I have today. I have a whole other workshop series that is designed to help people really uncover what it is they wanna do and uncover all of the different types of things that they might want to do in their lives. So if you want to connect with me and learn more, uh, you could go, this is my LinkedIn. And there is a symbol that, that several people um, on LinkedIn have started using to identify themselves as prolific people. And it's a little unicorn. They're putting it in their headline. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, yeah. This was super, super helpful, and I'm sure that our audience have taken back some of the tips that you know you had to share to uh, lead prolific lives. Um, thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause for Christy? Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, we will now be moving on uh, to SCP's workshop on deep fake generation delivered by Dr. Mauricio. Uh, there are a couple of slides that SCP does want to present. Let me just figure that out. Give me one second. There we go. Um, and wait, give me one second. That's fine. You can just uh, you do this way. Right? Yeah, the slide, so the slide should drop down. Apparently, you can just um. Yeah. Is it working? Perfect. Okay, you can take this. This works, right? I think this is what is being shown on screen. I'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. You can actually use this something else. Wait, hold that up. Just stick it on to here, and then you can just share the screen. Okay, so just take it back. Yeah, that's working. Oh, what? Yeah. Okay. Great, 
I'd like to give thanks to uh, Ms. Gari, Ms. Shreya, and Ms. Christie for their insightful lightning talks. Your expertise and experiences are invaluable, and we are honored to have had you here with us today celebrating women in tech. Next, I would like to introduce the Society of Competitive Programmers, also known as SCP. SCP is a community of USF students who share passion in coding and pushing their skills through competition. We host events, workshops, and contests that foster innovation, creativity, and excellence in the programming community. In the coming weeks, we have several exciting workshops lined up, including graph theory, dynamic programming, and other algorithmic topics. I think I have one more slide. So if you'd like to uh, scan the QR code, I'm not sure if you can, but it will take you to our link tree. You can just uh, double tap on the screen. USF students from all fields are encouraged to participate and expand their programming horizons. We have workshops on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, 6 to 8 p.m. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker and SCP advisor, Dr. Mauricio Pantlona Segundo. Dr. Mauricio is a postdoctoral researcher here at USF's Institute for Artificial Intelligence, providing expertise in computer vision and pattern recognition. He is also the advisor of SCP as many know, who is teaching us every day how to find our passion, crack the coding interview, and to become the best that we can be in the ever-evolving tech industry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mauricio to the stage as we look forward to his engaging and informative talk. Okay, now I have to find my presentation, right? It's, it's loaded up. It's right beside that one. I cannot even. What is the? Let me load it up. So it is right here, and you can do that with stuff. It's like true. Okay. Perfect. And what is this like? I should not be concerned no, about it. No, you don't. Okay. Don't be I'm going to rotate it. Or I'm going to be looking at it. Uh, okay, so good night, everyone. Nothing better than being here Friday night, right? Learning about neural networks. We had some previous talks on the topic. Uh, I'm the advisor for SCP, and I've been coding for almost 20 years, 20 years next year, uh, and working with artificial intelligence for the past 19 years, more specifically computer vision, where we deal with images, usually trying to extract information from images. Uh, I'm the advisor for SCP because I do like competition. I used to compete when I was uh, a student, although not very successful. I actually became better as I became a faculty in Brazil. Then I start training, I actually start training my students uh, with myself uh, and eventually start getting uh, better together. So this is usually what I do in the SCP. I'm not the kind of advisor that is really far away from the students. I meet them like every week I do. Uh, workshops and sometimes I participate in the workshops that are organized uh, by for uh, by the students as well. Uh, and in artificial intelligence, I usually work with biometrics, so face recognition, uh, fingerprint recognition, ear recognition, uh, the way you walk recognition, which is gate recognition, uh, and even the recognizing people by the way you code, you can do that as well. So I have worked with many different biometrics and also with remote sensing. Participated in some machine learning competitions want some money. Uh, so I do like competition. That's why I involved with SCP, uh, not only for programming, as I said, machine learning as well. And there's nothing uh, stopping us from eventually uh, starting to do something like that in SCP as well, uh, competing uh, on machine learning. But today I'm going to talk about deep fakes. I just wanted to talk about a topic that I know about. Uh, I've worked with that before, not necessarily generating deep fakes, but detecting deep fakes. Uh, and well, they are very popular nowadays, right? You see uh, posts about deep fakes everywhere. Is there a way I can put this in full screen here? Uh, 
like it was before? Yes. Um, please click on like the double screen. Yeah, sure. The double screen. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, so basically, the idea of the fakes is generating fake data, right? Not necessarily faces, but probably faces is the most intriguing part because we always felt that videos were sacred, right? If you have a video of someone doing something, that is true. Uh, and well, this is not true anymore. Uh, you can definitely alter a video for many different purposes. Uh, most of them are not really uh, well received in society because they are not being used like for good things. Uh, but you still have some good applications for deepfakes. So today, what we're going to do is to understand how deepfakes uh, work. And since I like coding, uh, there's no way I would do a talk without actually showing some code. And uh, the idea here is that you are going to see some very basic deepfake system, and you should be able to uh, work with it by yourself uh, after uh, today's talk. So there are different types of deepfakes. Uh, even though usually we just said, oh, this is it fake, it fake, you can well, fake everything. But even when we talk about faces, uh, we have different styles of uh, deep fake. The first one is was very popular a few years ago, which is creating new faces. So these people, some of these the people in here, they don't exist, right? Uh, and these neural networks are getting so good that it's getting quite hard for us humans to distinguish between what is a real face and what is a face that was generated by a neural network? Uh, can you guess? We have four real faces in here and four synthetic faces in here. Which ones are real and which ones are fake? By the way, the website below where I grabbed the images from, uh, you can just actually start responding the quiz and, uh, and see if you can differ. Usually, uh, this network was one of the first successful networks. So there are some noise in the image. Uh, some artifacts that make it quite easy to be honest uh i got like all these uh eight images right when i was going through the website uh to to check and basically that's because you have like some distors distortions in the image that make them like look uh not realistic especially in the edges uh of the face uh so the the fake ones in here like uh, they form like a checkboard pattern so the fake ones are the ones that don't have like the green shade in here. So the green one are the real ones. Uh, the other ones in here, all of those are fake. <clears throat> and again, the face is really good, but the background not so good, especially because the background can be anything. And usually with the neuro, the, the, the things that we have uh, for training uh, neural networks that are dealing with faces, we are going to have faces that are well controlled, but background that's going to be very complex and it's going to be very hard to have something that, is, that works really well for any kind of background. The second type of deepfake is attribute manipulation, and you can do something with that. Uh, maybe it's not so easy to control what you're going to do, and you, the results are not going to be uh, super realistic, but those things got really popular, especially, especially for apps, right? You get an app, you take your picture, and you make yourself older uh, or uh, younger, and this network in here, they usually use generative adversarial models. Uh, and the idea here is that you start from a random signal. So imagine that you have one array, you have a bunch of random values there, and then you feed this to a neural network, and this is going to work as a seed for the neural network to invent a new thing. And sometimes this can coincide with something from the training data set. So some faces that are generated can be really close to faces from the training set. But in many cases, you have like very uh, unique faces being generated. Uh, for this in here, like you usually have the opposite. You have a, a model that is actually going to receive some images and is going to learn to project these images into this array, like with some random values. But these random values are not going to be so random anymore. You want them to form a certain distribution that you can control, so you can sample from there or navigate to this distribution. So the idea here is that you have a network that works in both directions. Uh, so you can go from image to this array of values, and you can go from array of values back to image. And then you can modify this array of values for a certain image, uh, and you are going to be changing attributes. So literally, you just have to check how uh, are the directions. So you can see in this distribution where people that have blonde hair uh, are, 
and where people that don't have blonde hair are. And you can figure out like a direction that you can move your point in this distribution. And you can make like someone that is not blonde to become blonde. Someone that is not smiling is going to start smiling. Someone that is young can become older. So it's a, a different style of model, but it's going to give you more power. But this one, and it can also create new identities, which is also nice because if you have a distribution in the output, uh, you can just sample from the distribution and you're going to be creating a new face. Uh, this is actually the Glow model. It uh, was created by OpenAI, the same creators of Chat, Chat GPT that you probably are using or uh, testing, right? Uh, okay, so next one, identity swap. So you give two pictures, right? This one also very popular in face uh, uh, in, in phone uh, apps. You give two pictures, you can swap the faces. Uh, sometimes they don't look really realistic. Sometimes they look really well, like in this case in here. Uh, we have two face swaps, one that looks really nice, the other one not so much. Uh, so it's hard, right? When you have face from two different people to put like uh, one face from one person in the same conditions as the face of the other person, not necessarily an easy test. That's why we don't have like great results of all the time. But this is uh, okay. Again, yeah, you can do uh, identity swap even in videos. Uh, and the real problem comes when you actually can like do this uh, expression swap. So you can have uh, one video from some person and you have some other person guiding this person to be saying something that they are not supposedly saying or doing something that they are not supposedly doing. Uh, this is when the fakes start getting dangerous. Uh, for the other applications, uh, other examples, you, you also can have uh, dangerous applications, uh, but for this is probably the one that usually governments uh, I'm mostly concerned about uh, because you can spread the information by simply getting a video of someone that is uh, well known, probably someone that people put their trust on, and you make these people say something that they actually didn't say. Uh, and then a lot of people are going to start believing that. So we don't want this uh, to happen, but unfortunately, like uh, this happens. And what we're going to do today is do a very simple model that is going to do that. So we are going to learn how to get one video from one person, one video from another person. They are doing some very basic facial movements, and you're going to make one replicate uh, the other. <clears throat> so this is like the extreme cases. You can see like one video, one is the original video, the left, uh, uh, the, your left uh, is the real video, and your right, Basically, they are just feeding uh, the information about a face moving. In this case, they are feeding the information about the actual face just to see how close to the original video they can get just using the output of the network. So the network is not receiving an image as input. It's just receiving like uh, a face pose and a, a certain expression. And you can see that it's producing exactly the same video that you have in, in the input. And this is the real danger of, uh, of the fakes these days, right? The videos are so realistic that, well, we believe them. And we can also do fake uh, voices. Uh, so in the end, uh, you can actually replicate the face, uh, the voice, and people are going to start believing that this video comes from this person. But not necessarily all deep fakes are bad. So this is a nice application that I found. Uh, there was a politician in India. Uh, and in India, you have many different languages in different regions of the country. This is actually common in many countries, not only India. Uh, but this is. Uh, something that happens there. And well, not necessarily all politicians know to speak, uh, know how to speak all the languages of the country so they can communicate with the entire country. So what they used was actually deep fakes. So the politician is speaking the language that he knows, and then uh, somebody else is dubbing the politician, but the video is being used, like they are using deep fake to make the politician say what this other person is saying to connect it better, like uh, create a connection between the politician uh in the population so this is a good example of like uh deep fakes using deep fakes and this is like for everything right every time that you create something it can be used like for good things can be used for bad things face recognition people have face recognition for a lot of years but only now people are starting to discuss about privacy right because if you have face recognition systems that work then privacy starts becoming an issue uh, so it's not that the fakes are really bad every time, but uh, but we always have to be careful about the uses that we are doing. Uh, 
So this is how this system that does really well for this kind of video work. And they are very complicated. We definitely cannot cover a system like that uh, in one hour. Uh, but the idea here is you have two videos. You have you, you need to extract information about this video. So you need to learn about the orientation of the face, the expression that the face is making, uh, the illumination of the scene, uh, uh, and the texture of, of the person. And then basically what you do, you swap some information. So if you see what's happening here, uh, we are extracting the same information from, I don't know if I can, if you can see the person, no. Okay, so we have like some blocks in there. You can see uh, the green part coming from Obama. You have like illumination and identity in the top, and then you have pose expression and eyes in the bottom. And you have the same thing for the second subject. So what you are doing is actually you're crossing information, right? You get the visual information from the first stream, but you get the face information from the second stream. And the face information is pose, so where the person is looking, uh, expression, which is going to be what the person is talking or, or doing with his face, and eyes to show like what the person, where the person is looking. So basically, you just get the movements of the second person to control the first person, but all the visual appearance is going to be from the first person. And there's a lot of computer graphics and machine learning cross together in here to make this network uh, to work. Uh, we don't have enough time to do that, so we are going to do something else instead, which is we are going to try to normalize our faces so they all look about the same. And we are not going to do this fancy normalization as well, uh, but the idea of the normalization is try to make the faces look forward and have like the eyes aligned. Uh, so this is a neural network that does that. It doesn't do like a, a great job, but uh, especially in cases that are hard, like when the person is not looking uh, to the front, uh, like looking towards the camera, it can somehow get a face that looks frontal. Uh, and the idea of the normalization is try to normalize pose, facial expressions, lighting conditions. Uh, we don't want to do everything, all those things. Uh, we want to apply a certain sequence of steps in here. Uh, we are going to locate the face in the video. Again, there are different neural networks that can do that for you. Uh, we are not going to implement this neural network. We are just going to implement whatever comes after this. We are going to use uh, a neural network that detects face that is available uh, in the web. So once you locate the face, you are going to locate some uh, landmarks in this face. So you can use this information to do some image transformation and hopefully make your image more controlled. Uh, and we basically the network that is going to do the detection also already gives us some landmarks. So these two steps are actually basically one for us. Uh, and finally, you do some image normalization. So again, you can do really uh, good stuff using neural networks uh, that can give you like a very frontal face, even if you have like a person that has a face that like is looking into the other direction. Probably if you are looking backwards, it's not going to do a good job. But uh, if you have a lot of enough face information, you can recover a frontal face. Uh, but we don't have time for that. So we are just going to do some basic rotation. So this is what we're going to do today. Uh, we are going to locate the face and some landmarks in the face. And we're going to somehow rotate the face, crop the face. And this is the face that we're going to use for deep fake, right? So we are going to have videos of people like with this square on the face, with this square on the face. Uh, and we are going to map uh, these cropped videos one to another. And you could always try to think about the reverse operation. So if you have the face being mapped like to another face, you could like do the inverse uh, translation rotation and you could like map one face into the other and you would be implementing your own uh, face swap uh, application. So this is the network that you're going to use. MTCNN is very simple, so it's easy to understand. And basically what this network does is detect faces. Uh, so you can see all the faces that we have in this second image that has like eight different images inside. And also the text, the landmarks in those faces. And we can use this information to normalize our pose. So what we're going to do is we are going to make sure our eyes and our mouth are always in the same position. Uh, the center of our mouth are always in the same position in the normalized image. So if you see the last column in here, uh, this is the input image. This is the output image of our normalization module. And you can see that the eyes are exactly in the same location. Of course, we cannot do miracles. So if the person is if you don't have two eyes in the image, there's nothing you can do. Uh, but if, whenever we can, we have the two eyes in the same position and we have the mouth, the center of the mouth in the same position as well. Uh, and we will use some videos that are not uh, 
as hard as like anything on these faces. So now I really need the mouse. So okay. Looks like uh, practicing eye contact is a thing on YouTube now. But the nice thing about these videos is that they are very still. So this is what the kind of video that I wanted. So this is the input that we're going to receive uh, for this module. And this is what we want in the output. Like we want a video just of the face of the person. And this face is going to be uh, reasonably well controlled. So we can uh, use only the changes that are happening in this face, uh, the changes uh, in the expressions uh, to map uh, the identity of one person, the movements of one person in another person while keeping the identity of this other person. Uh, you can access this code. I, I'm assuming you will have access to these slides later on. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can open this in here. I'm going to use your account. I don't know who is, okay. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, so, and this is nice that this is a workshop organized by the Google Developer Society because I'm going to use some Google tools. So I don't know if you ever heard about Google Collab, but Google Collab is basically an online place where you can code in Python, just like you have like usually your Jupyter Labs, but this one is on the cloud. It stores all your files on the Google Drive, uh, and it gives you free access to GPUs. GPUs are really important when you want to train things with machine learning. So for this module, not so much, but for the other things that we're going to do, we definitely need GPUs. Uh, and they give GPUs for you for free. All you have to do is to go in the runtime. Uh, you manage your session. No, right. there's some place in here where you can change the runtime type. Yep. And you can choose between like no GPU, GPU, or TPU. Uh, TPU, you never get it one unless you are paying for uh, Google Collab. But if you use the free version, uh, you can use a GPU. Uh, all the time, I would say. So as I said, we are going to use, uh, oh. run anyway, I trust me. And we are going to install MTCNN because it's not uh, by default uh, supported by Google Collab, but I'm going to use later on uh, TensorFlow for training a model. Uh, actually, Keras, and this is already supported. Uh, things like downloading things from Google Drive is already supported. So these are the files that we're going to use. Uh, and this code is very easy to edit if you want to try it on later on with your own images or with your own videos. I try to make it as easy to understand as possible uh, with the easiest things that we have uh, from TensorFlow uh, and OpenCV and whatever I'm using uh, next. So. OK, so the first thing that we have to do is to actually load our detector. And well, you're just basically the library that we install is in here. We are going to uh, create an instance of that. And I'm just printing one of the elements of this network, which is saying to me, what's the minimum face size that I can detect in an image, which is 20 pixels, which is quite small. Uh, but we are not going to be using this kind of small image. Uh, and this is where the magic is happening. So if you are using this library, there's nothing to fencing here, I'm just running the loading an image. I'm using OpenCV to do that. Uh, I'm visualizing the image, and then I'm running the detector uh, using this image as input, and I'm printing all the results from the detector so we can see what the detector is going to give us. So this is the image that works as input, and we probably need to detect at least eight faces in here. Since those things are trained, we don't know that what kind of data they were trained on. There is always a chance that we have some missing faces or some extra faces. But in this case, we have exactly eight faces. And if you see what we have as information in here, we have a bounding box, which is going to be a rectangle around each face, uh, a confidence that is going to tell how confident this model is that this is actually a face, and some coordinates for some uh, uh, some facial uh, attributes. Uh, and this is what we are going to use to normalize our faces, right? So knowing that, we can do stuff like uh, what I'm going to do is the mouse keeps going to the other screen. screen. Uh, let's just see the, this information like in the image. So this is the result of the detection. These are the bounding boxes and the confidence values. So uh, you can see that the confidence is high when the first uh, the, the face is almost frontal. When you have like a, a face that is not so frontal, maybe the confidence is not that high anymore, at least in one case. Uh, and we also can visualize 
uh, a landmark. So I'm just using OpenCV functions in here. Uh, it's quite easy to follow up if you want to check it later. I'm basically just picking a random color, color and drawing a rectangle with this color and also writing the confidence on the image. These are all functions from OpenCV. In here, same thing, I'm drawing circles in the locations where we have the key points and I'm cropping the area uh, where we have the face. So this is just to illustrate uh, what uh, is the output of the detector, right? What we actually want to do is to uh, normalize our face, right? And this is the class that I'm giving to you. So basically what you're having here is a class where you specify what size you want the face to be. And no matter the size that you're going to choose, uh, this is going to create an image in the output that's going to have the size. And we have this padding size in here, values. And these padding sizes are coming from these values in here. So you have a padding on top that basically shows how much of the image should be the forehead before we reach uh, the center of the eyes. We have a pad in the bottom that is going to be how, much, how many pixels we have to have in the bottom before we reach the center of the mouth. Uh, and also a side pad in here that is like this distance between uh, the side of the image and the center of the eyes, which is, that is going to be the same uh, for both sides. So this is what we have in here. Uh, the padding side, padding top, and padding bottom is just defining the the area of pixels uh, on top of the eyes, uh, below the mouth, and in the side of the eyes. And all we have to do if we know this function from OpenCV, which actually deforms one face to fit another, is to create some canonical positions for these positions for the center of the eyes and the center of the mouth. And this is what I'm doing here. I'm using the input that is coming from the image to create three coordinates, uh, the center of the left eye, the center of the right eye, and the center of the mouth. That is basically the average of the corners of the mouth. Uh, and I also, and I'm using these padding parameters that are given to the class to define uh, the coordinates uh, of my three uh, key points in this image that is going to be in the output. So I use this padding information to compute where the eye is supposed to be, where the mouth is supposed to be, and then I use OpenCV to deform my image in a way that these three points always fall in the same place. Okay, uh, and then all I have to do is like if my input is a is a is an image. Uh, I detect uh, all the faces in this image, and I call this affine function to rotate my face, and I have the rotated face. If I have a video, I just need a loop, right, that is going to go through all the frames of the video, and for every frame, we detect the faces. Uh, we use the affine function to transform the face, and we are going to have a normalized video. So basically, this is what's happening uh, in this class. Again, not a lot of code. I'm trying to use as much uh information coming from opencv and mtcnn as possible and well you don't have to change this class all you have to do now is to associate this class class and you can provide an image uh so if you call the function process image this image is going to receive an image you can see here that we have a very big uh face uh, from michael jordan and the output is going to be 128 by 128 pixels with the rotated face you can see that there is some rotation in here uh, in between the eyes, like this eye is uh, higher in the image than this other eye. But if you see the normalized image, they are aligned after the affine mark. And well, what we actually want to do is to process video. So again, I have a function there that is going to process video. I also created a function that shows the video as a GIF so we can see the result. Uh, I have one tiny comment in here that is just to make it fast today. I'm only running things for the first 20 frames. Everything else I'm going to use like pre-computed faces. Uh, but you can just remove those two lines and it's going to run for the entire video. So in here is the output, the first 20 frames of the video. Uh, uh, and the video is also just a segment of this video that I downloaded from YouTube. Uh, I just Google frontal faces and look for some videos. Uh, and okay, so basically here we have our Aligned faces. So first stage is done. Uh, what do we do next? There are many different architectures that we can use uh, to. Oh, actually, is it here? Yep. 
So if you look for deep fake uh, implementations in the web, you're going to find many different implementations. They can be categorized in many different categories. And many of those like uh, are too complicated for us to implement today, except for one. This one is quite easy to understand. Uh, and after you understand this one, it actually gets easier to understand the other ones. So let's start, uh, let's do this one today. And hopefully if this talk is enough to maybe spark some interest in deep, le uh, deep learning or image analysis on you, uh, you can look uh, into other uh, related uh, networks later on. So the idea here uh, is very simple. We are going to use one network architecture called autoencoder, okay? But we are going to have, usually autoencoders have one encoder and one decoder. Uh, it's very similar to what how we do like encryption, right? You encrypt something, then you decrypt something. Uh, same idea here, our encoder is going to project our face images into some latent space that is going to generate like some representation that is probably going to be smaller than our input image. Uh, and then our decoder is going to receive this representation and it's going to reconstruct in the output. But we are going to use this one encoder to decoder tricks. So uh, tricks so we can actually generate some deep fakes. So the idea here is we train only one encoder that is going to work for the two uh, people that we are using for training. Uh, and basically what I did in here is I downloaded two videos from YouTube, passed the two videos uh, to my face processing, reprocessing uh, tool, and I just saved all the cropped faces uh, to use later on uh, for training. So we passed faces from it, uh, this arrow here is basically trying to represent shared weights. So this encoder in here is only one, but that works for any kind of face that we are using for training. And usually for deep fakes, you don't use much more than only two identities. If you want a deep fake system to work really well, you want to make it specific for two people, okay? So you're going to have one person that is always going to be the driver, the person that is going to provide the expressions, and we want another person to be like the output, right, the, the texture. What about if you have three things that you want to know? You can do that as well, but what I'm saying is that if you train a network to work for three people, it's never going to be as accurate as a network that works only for two people. But if you want three people, you can always just train three networks, right? Every pair of people you can train on network. It's not, we are not merging, right? We are projecting things. Yeah, but yeah, the task becomes harder. If the task becomes harder, the network needs to be more, uh, needs to generalize better. Generalization is not good when you want real realism, you know? Uh, if you try to generalize well for many different faces, what happens is that you do worse for all of them. If you specialize in two specific faces, this is your best scenario. You cannot like do deep fake using only one face, right? So the minimum is two. If you try to use more, you're going to get some drop in performance. And this is usually like the systems that you find online work. You provide like two folders with faces from two different people and they learn to project one face into the other. But there are cases that you actually learn to project, uh, generate, uh, animate multiple faces. But again, they never, they're never going to be as realistic as the faces that you can generate with a system that works only with two identities. Uh, okay, so we project these faces into some like latent code, right? Some, I have just some random images there representing this latent code. And instead of having only one decoder, we have now two decoders. One decoder that only knows the first subject and the other decoder that only knows the second subject. And well, this technique is, it has, some specific problems like we don't we are not forcing anything to be aligned so we need some luck luck sometimes to get some results but like with some luck and some good design in the network uh we can cross things later on so we feed the video from one person uh in the network pass through the encoder we get this latent representation and we feed this latent representation into the decoder of the other person and then we get the video of the other person in the output uh with the same movements of the person in the input and what I'm saying that you need some luck is because uh, there is no control over what is being aligned with what, right? So in here, we just have the person either neutral or smiling. So the chance of getting a good result is better. And that's why I'm using this example. But if you have like a person that is just frowning and another person that is just smiling in the video, the network is not going to learn to transform a neutral face into a frowning face, right? Because this network in here, Let's say that the first person is frowning and this one is smiling. This one never seen a smile. 
and this will never seen a frown. So when you have like the frowning in here, this person is probably going to be smiling because the network is going to learn to, to like align an open mouth with a smile. The network cannot invent new data, okay? It's going to try to align the best uh, the data that it has. So it's uh, slightly harder to train because of that. So instead of starting directly from there, let's first uh, implement an autoencoder and then we just change this autoencoder uh, to, to, to create a deep fake. So what is an autoencoder? It's just a network that creates the same input as output, okay? So this network doesn't do anything fancy. It learns to get receiving input and uh, pro projects it in the output. So something that does nothing is an autoencoder, just provides the input as output, right? But in here, we want to do something specific. We want to make this piece of information progressively smaller, right? So in here, we have some like compressive, compressed representation of the input. Uh, and with this compressed representation, hopefully, uh, we are not going to like be capable of reconstructing anything. We are just going to be able to reconstruct really, really well uh, the distribution of data that we have in the input, which is the face of a person. Okay, so basically here we are learning to compress a face into some numbers and then decompress this, some of these numbers into a face again. This is what an autoencoder does. It has two parts, an encoder and a decoder as you've seen before. Basically this is a part of the neural network. The second is also a neural network. What would the purpose of an autoencoder? So depends on what you are using it for, right? You can use autoencoders for compression, for instance. Uh, so as long as this latent representation is small, you learn how to compress faces or how to compress images if your input can be an image. Uh, but you can also use for initialized neural networks. So you can learn the distribution of a certain piece of uh, collection of data by training an autoencoder and then throwing the decoder off. You know? So you're just using a part of the other. Yeah. So there are many different applications for autoencoders. And in, in our case, we want to learn a latent representation that you can use later on to trick the decoder of the other person. Okay. And autoencoders basically use convolutional neural networks. I don't know if you ever heard about it. So convolutional neural networks, they are basically layers of convolutions. And convolutions, they are not complicated operations. They are just like you have a small kernel that is a matrix with some weights. And these weights is what you are learning uh, in the neural network. And you multiply this kernel like by a certain part of the input. You align this kernel with a part of your input. And this generates one value in the output. And then you slide this kernel and you compute the next value of your matrix. So basically, a convolution is just a filter of the image. Uh, and well, I have two examples in here of filters. So depending on how these weights are like uh, distributed in your kernel, you are going to see different things from the input. You are going to spike different activations from your input. So here you see vertical edges with that specific kernel. So because we are checking differences like between pixels in different columns, we are going to have higher response in areas where we have difference in the color uh, like because we have like some vertical borders in the image. And the other one is the opposite. So we're going to see horizontal, horizontal borders uh, in the image. So, and these are things that you are not going to handcraft. The neural network is going to learn by itself, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. We are just trying to understand what convolutions are. And so a convolutional neural network is basically a sequence of convolutional layers, okay? So this is an implementation of an autoencoder. Uh, auto you have an image as input, and then you apply some convolutions, and then we do use multiple call max pooling to reduce the dimensionality of this image. So we make them smaller because remember, we want the latent space to be as small as possible, right? Uh, so we use max pooling, and max pooling is basically define a kernel size, two by two. You get the maximum value in this two by two size, and suddenly you have an image that is has the height, has the width, uh, and you still maintain all that dimension from here. So again, and then convolution again, spooling again, and eventually you have some latent space that is really small. Now for the autoencoder, we have to do the reverse order of operation so we can reconstruct uh, our original image. So we do some uh, upsampling, so the image gets bigger, then we do some convolution, then we do some upsampling, and we do some convolution, and eventually we get our a uh, tensor, like a, a matrix in the output that has the same dimensions as the input, and we can train this to become an autoencoder. This might be a stupid question, but then what's the difference between convolution and compression? 
what do you mean by convol convolution is just the operation you don't need to compress right you can see that uh the size of the the result of the convolution in here is actually bigger than the uh the what convolution is doing is it take convolution is just transforming the image uh trying to find some pieces of information that are usable over there you know and they are tiny uh responses to some small filters but as you layer those things out these things start getting more and more powerful so if you only use one layer of convolutions you can learn vertical edges horizontal edges not nothing fancy but if you combine two layers of convolution the second gives the capability to learn corners right because if you know vertical edges and you know horizontal edges you can combine the two and you can uh, detect corners and then with corners like for the next layer you maybe be able to detect check checkerboard patterns you know so as you add more and more layers in your neural network you get more uh, uh, the capacity to represent things gets more and more powerful but the convolution itself it doesn't change the uh, dimensionality of the data you can apply one convolution that is going to maintain exactly the same size as the input wow. <clears throat> what makes it like to get smaller is the way we are combining the convolutions with these other operations to make our uh, array smaller and smaller over time. <clears throat> and well, we have those things implemented on Keras. So Keras is basically a high level of TensorFlow. TensorFlow is the differentiable library created by Google for uh, neural network development. So we can basically implement this layer that the convolution using this function, uh, conv2d. Uh, we can implement the layers that will reduce the size of our matrices uh, using max pool 2D, and we can use assembly 2G to increase the size of our matrix when we are implementing the decoder that's going to go back to the size of the image. So these are the three main things that we need to know uh, to implement a, a delta encoder. Uh, and basically, the result of an auto encoder, if we train for a long time, is that the output should be uh, match the uh, input exactly. Uh, I'm not training this model for a long time, so you can you probably see some differences, but this result is quite good for what you're going to do today. Uh, so let's try to check this code now, and I probably have to the, uh, turn this one off. Otherwise, Google is going to say that I have too many sessions running. Okay, so now instead of... Uh, running the face processing i'm going to just download in here the video processed already i pre-processed those things and and save the files but again you can just use the previous notebook to generate some uh detected faces and then you can use this notebook to start using this one to implement a uh an autoencoder so we are going to be using tensorflow now and our show video function is slightly harder now because we want to see uh the input and the output of the network. So I just changed the show video function to show uh, two videos at the same time. <clears throat> I don't know how, but I only have five minutes, that's it. Okay, I, I, I'll try to finish everything in 10 minutes. The thing after this is dinner, so like this is the last word. Okay, cool. I, I'm not going to hold you too much uh, after uh, eight, I, I promise. So this is just to visualize, right? And this is the implementation of the autoencoder. So I'm creating some functions in here just to make it more clear. But basically, autoencoder, the encoder in here is just alternating between convolution, max pooling, convolution, max pooling, right? So the convolution is apl applying some, uh, learning some filters to operate over the result of the previous layer. Uh, and the max pooling is reducing the size uh, of the overall tensor. So we are always uh, learning new things and shrinking the information. Learning new things, shrinking the information. Uh, and you can go uh, way more than what we have in the slides. In the slide, what we have described is just uh, the first four lines in here. I have a network in here that have actually twice the size uh, of, of what is uh, illustrated in the slides. And we can even keep going. You know, you, you can keep like, doing more convolutions, more max pooling. And the decoder is the opposite, right? So if in the encoder we convolve, shrink, convolve, shrink, and here we expand, convolve, expand, convolve, expand, convolve. So same operations that we had before, but in the opposite order, plus a less convolution, uh, the final convolution in here to project uh, the output of the decoder uh, to something that has the same dimensions uh, of the input. And then our loss function, like uh, when I talk loss function, it's basically 
what the network uses as information to train, right? So how do you know how bad the network is doing? This is what we call the loss function. And for an autoencoder, this is quite easy. It's just the difference between the output and the input, right? So if you compute the numeric difference between each pixel in the images, sum this number uh, up, you have like how bad this image is, right? Uh, the closer it is, the close to zero is going to the closer to zero is going to be uh, the error between the two images, and this is what you use uh, to train your neural network. So if we see the code in here, basically what we use as the loss to train our model is going to be the mean squared error, and what I do is uh, provide as input and like reference the same data. So basically, I provide images as input, and my reference to train the model are the same images, right? So I want to produce in the output the same images that I give in, in the input. Uh, and then we can just run this code. I have a, a small function in here and some callbacks from Keras. This is just to show how the, the network is provide, uh, is performing after a few epochs of training. And basically one epoch of training is one pass over all the frames that we are using for, uh, for training. Uh, and what you see here is that after one epoch, the reconstruction result is not going to be that great because we started our neural network with random weights, which means this neural network does, knows nothing, right? And then we keep training it. Uh, and as we progressively train it over time, uh, the results in the output are going to look more and more realistic. So here you can see that the input is this woman and the output is Grinch uh, with some makeup to look really smooth. But eventually things that the network is going to like learn that like, hey, I don't want green in the output. So the difference between green uh, and skin color is really high. So the network is going to look into that and it's going to use that to put update the weights of the kernels that we have in the convolution operations. And it's going to get give us a better result in the next epoch and so on. So you can see here that in the second epoch, after two passes uh, over the frames that you're using for training, the color distribution looks nicer. In here, we can start to see some uh, eyes. And if this, this code in here keeps training, uh, it is going to get better and better. So let's wait. So maybe instead of waiting, I should like continue on. We have just a, a couple more slides. Uh, yep. So I'm going to show you the result of, of this code later. Uh, but in the end, we are going to have something like this, okay? The output is going to look very similar to the input, uh, but in between, we are going to have like a, some small representation uh, of the face. And then comes, we go back to the one encoder to decoder, right? So how do we implement this? Uh, and the only difference is that instead of only having one decoder, now we are going to instantiate two decoders. So we are going to call the decoder function twice, uh, and we're going to have two outputs. And we have to know that uh, when I feed an image from the first person, I want to guide the first decoder. And when I feed a, a, an image from the second person, I want to guide uh, the second decoder. That's the only difference between the code that we had uh, and the code that we're going to have in here. Uh, the results are starting to look better, as you can see here. So let me go through the code while that other code is running. So in here, uh, I changed my visualization function again just to show three videos now. We're going to have the input video, the reconstruction with the first decoder, the reconstruction with the second decoder. One of them needs to look really like the input. The other one needs to look like the other person. If we succeed in doing that, uh, then our network, our network is doing really well. Uh, you can see here that the implementation of the, the encoder decoder is exactly the same that, that I used before. So no changes, just a sequence of convolutions and max poolings in the first one and upsampling and convolution in the second one. Here is where we change things. Uh, we have two decoders instead of one, right? Both receive the same input that is like the latent representation coming from the encoder. Uh, and we are going to have these two outputs in here, X1 and X2, which is like the two decoders. Uh, and you can see here that we also have two pieces of information now. We need to know which images are from the first person and which images are from the second person. So basically these are just uh, one in here when we have images from the first person. And here we have one when we have images from the second person and zero otherwise. And then we can just create one image in here by combining the two, you know. Uh, basically if I, if I have label one 
in one, I'm going to uh, I'm going to have label zero in two, which means that I'm going to get the output of the first decoder uh, and com and compare uh, with the input. But if I have an image of the second person, this label is going to be one, and this label is going to be zero, which means that I'm going to get the output of the second decoder uh, and compare to the input. Right. So depending on the identity of the person, I use a different decoder result output to guide uh, the training of my neural network. That's the main difference, and this is like what is doing all the magic. Uh, everything else is going to look about the same. So let's just see if this is done. Yes, this is done. So you can see here after 256 epochs, so our network gets better and better over time. If I can manage to go down. Yeah. Uh, and the output in here is much better than the beginning. And you can keep training. So you have access to this code. You can just double, triple, uh, train it for 10 times longer. Uh, and your results are going to look very close to the input images. OK? Uh, so let me stop this. And let's start the other one. So for this one, I'm actually going to show the result before uh, I start running, because I'm going to do some change. Otherwise, we are not going to have enough time. So we have the two decoders in here, so not a lot of difference compared to what we had before. But if I train the, 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 the network as it is right now, this is the output that I have. And I wanted to show that to you so I can actually change it later. So you can see that the network is clearly learning something. Oh, what is? No. Where is it? Yes, it's still here. So the first decoder always produces something with the same color distribution of the first person. The second decoder uh, always produces something with the same color of the second person. But you can see that the results are only realistic when I have the input uh, with the same identity. OK, so you can see the output of the first decoder for the first person looks really nice. Uh, but when I try to use like the second decoder, I have like this uh, mix of the two people, like uh, a lot of noise. So clearly not the result that we wanted. Right. Uh, and this is the one of the tricky parts uh, of uh, training a one encoder to decoder for deep fake generation. How do we like make sure things align together uh, in the latent space? So, and this is what we have in the final two slides. So, if our latent space is too big, like if our latent representation is too large, there is a good chance that the representations of the first person when passing through the, the encoder are never going to coincide uh, with the representations of the second person. And then when you feed uh, this representation from the first person to this encoder, this encoder only learned to operate in this region of the latent space, right? So when you have the latent space like from a different region, this encoder doesn't know what to do and produces like some image that is not good. And this one is actually looks nice, but uh, what we usually have is something like what we we are having right now, right? A lot of noise and and well, it's not going to look realistic. So we are not going to trick anyone. We are not going to fool anyone with those images. So how do we improve those things? Uh, can anyone think about what should we do? Yes, all we have to do is to shrink our latent space. And to shrink our latent space, all we have to do is to keep the shrinking our information. So we add more convolutions and more shrinking operations to our encoder. And then we have to, of course, increase our decoders as well. But then we're going to have a way smaller uh, latent space. Uh, and with that, uh, hopefully things are going to align well and we're going to have some good results. So this is the thing that we don't have in here. So let me uncomment these lines. So these lines were not here just because I wanted to show that we can increase the size. We actually need to increase the size for uh, the deep fake code to work. So now we have basically some encoder that has some more layers, same thing for the decoder. And you can see that I always do a decoder that matches the encoder because they should have about the same capacity. Otherwise, one st starts to fool the other. Uh, but this is the only change that I'm going to do in the code, add more layers. So let's rerun this code uh, with this configuration of the network and hopefully you're going to have some better results. So we are going to leave this training and I can answer some questions while 
hopefully we discover that this thing works. <laughs> because this is supposed to be my last slide. Yeah. So I don't know if this was clear enough. I try to show you how it works. Uh, I'm giving you some code that is quite simple. You can see that the number of lines is ridiculously small. Uh, you should be able to like spend a few minutes later on and you should be able to understand everything that is happening there. Sometimes you might need to look into the documentation of specific functions from some of some libraries, but the code is really small. Uh, and what we are doing is a sequence of steps that is quite understandable, right? Again, autoencoders, they are able to reconstruct what we have in the input. And we are taking advantage of this ability to create two decoders and we learn to reconstruct two different people. And then we cross information and hopefully we get good results. Uh, but this is the code that actually generated these results in here. So in theory, we are going to see something like this soon where we have uh, images coming from this person and goes through the decoder and you get images from the first person as output. And the opposite is also true. We have images from the first person, goes through the, the decoder of the second person, and we have images of the second person uh, as output. <clears throat> Any questions? No? Nope. Too easy? <laughs> Are you doing research in this area? Um, I did research on deepfake detection a few years ago. Uh, right now, I'm working mostly uh, on gate recognition, uh, which is recognizing people from surveillance cameras by the way they walk when you don't have a face to recognize them. But yeah, I do a lot of research in deep learning for vision applications. Yep, yep. but I guess, I, I don't know if you guys shared the slides or not, but so this is the last, oh no. We'll be sharing every single slide. Okay. So this is being streamed on YouTube, right? So later on, when you go to the YouTube video, every single link that was there will be in the description of the video. Okay. So basically, this is the late, latest code that is the one that actually does the deep fake. Uh, and then this one is the autoencoder. So this one receives one image of a face as input, produces the same face image in the output. And this one is the preprocessing. So you can feed an image, a uh, video. And by the way, I didn't say the limitations, right? But this works only if you have only one face in the video. You can change the code to like work for multiple faces. I just wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So if you have multiple faces, this code is probably going to keep alternating between faces and you are not going to have a video that is going to be of one person uh, moving around and probably not going to work so well. Okay. But again, you probably will be a, will have access to these links soon. And for some reason, this is taking way longer than it takes normally. We should have results about of different epochs. Um, apart from that, are there any other questions for Dr. Marie And there are many different professors here at USF that work with neural networks nowadays. I would say that most faculty have to work with AI these days, otherwise yeah. they are not going to have like the same results. Oh, it is not running. Did they press stop? No. That's why it's not showing. For some reason, I was disconnected, I think. Yeah. So yeah, I'm having a connection issue in here. Uh, but well, if you don't believe me, uh, you can definitely run this later on uh, and you are going to see something uh, like this because I would not be able to create such a good, cool gift, uh, dot gift, gift, uh, if the network didn't work. I swear to you that these are actual results from the network. Uh, and well, eventually, I don't know, we might be able to see this. Let me, I do we have another talk now or? Okay. No, Everything so, is uh, that was it. Uh, guys, do we have any other questions for Dr. Mauricio?
Um, if not, thank you so much. Can we have on? Thank you so much. Uh, this is a really cool topic, and um, you know the explanation that you gave was amazing with like the gifts and everything and the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Malisha. And uh, ICP is a really cool club where they have cooperative. Their main focus is ICPC, something uh, that they usually go to on an annual basis. Uh, but they also have other workshops, such as I think intro to graph theory was something else that was coming up. And Dr. Marie also does his series of cognitive coding. So if that is something that you guys are interested in, definitely check that club out. Um, but thank you so much. We also uh, participate on hackathons, which are not necessarily just competitive coding. You know, you are you have to develop develop cool things like things with machine learning uh, in order to gain some prizes. So yeah. we usually have a pool of participants that don't like competitive programming, but they still participate uh, on hackathons. So if you don't like like data structures and algorithms for some reason and theory, computational theory, uh, you can still like participate in those things where you have like your uh, using your skill to create new products and hopefully uh, win some prizes in the process. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mauricio. Uh, we will be moving into dinner with ACM and GDSE. But before we move to uh, the dinner, some of the people on the meeting do have to leave. Uh, so before we move, do you guys mind if we take a picture here? Really quick? So guys, can you also come here? Like you can come here and also the the people who actually were like into making this entire event come to the reality with Carol. And I think can you call it Mikita if that's fine? Yeah. Nathan Mathias and Ali Reed. So, yep, and if you can come to that. Yep. And after a quick picture, of ACM has some things to share, and then we can move to dinner. Dinner will be in a different room, but before dinner, ACM does have something to share. So, yeah, that can happen really quick. Can you guys come down? Um, and we'll just move back to, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take. <laughs> I, I mean, we can keep it running. I'll just go back to the original meeting because Dwani and everybody are there. Um, it's Google's playing. Oh, yeah. It's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault, guys. Everything that doesn't work. Uh, here. So, everybody in the meeting, uh, Nidhi, Dwani, if you guys don't mind switching on your cameras uh, so that we can take a group photo really quick and then ACM can take over. Oh, you're on the beach right there. <laughs> <laughs> in um, Australia, right? Oh, it yeah. uh, Nidhi, if you're here, can you please switch on your camera? If not, we can uh, take a quick a picture really quick. All right. Um, uh, can, do, can, does somebody have like a good phone? I have a very bad phone. Take a picture. Yeah, just take like a couple of pictures. Right here. Oh, wait, I have slides, bro, which we never showed, but like, has the... Oh, is this the ones that you did all night? Yeah, dude. So that has the, all the clubs and everything. Oh my goodness. Wait, uh, give me one second. Let me, how do I do this? You can share on Teams yep. and pin it and then... Yep. Uh... Uh, oh, sure. Perfect. Double yeah. Perfect. All right. Uh, can we have all the clubs and can you guys come in? And so just to give you guys an idea of how, how long it took for this event to take place, we started planning this event in, um, I believe, February. 
and then the day of the got like you know delaying delaying and we were deciding the speakers and everything so this entire event with you know the merch and the food and everything took about two months but at the end of it today here we are so i'm really proud of how this event went and obviously it's still pending but yeah thank you so much guys for coming here um and yeah so at GDSC, this is again something that we do. Uh, they, we make brackets because that's our logo with like our hands. So if that's something that you guys want to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How about we do a WTM one? <laughs> Like like this maybe. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs> All right. But the CP has secret handshakes, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought they have the handshakes. So. Oh, I, I have, have, I have so. a good. You want to direct me? Okay. The only thing is, I think uh, the meeting was here, Tata. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, the Google uh, you from can still uh, keep that open, and uh, they can still see the the screen, right? Through the camera. Or uh, something with the Oh, give me one. Should I leave the meeting? Uh, just let them know. They can see. Yeah. And yeah, they so, can. So, yeah, they can. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So the, perfect. Uh, you're gonna do it, but you never did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just looking at. Right, so they can't see that. Right? Let me mute myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay, guys, I won't take a lot of time because uh, we're kind of behind on the schedule. So I just want to make one or two announcements before we do the general session. Okay. Um, I hope you guys are hungry because we have a lot. If you don't know what is ACM, let me quickly do you two. Okay. So that's a fact for organization for computer science and engineering. Uh, we have been operating here for I don't even know how long. Uh, the ACM was formed in 1947, so uh, we are more than 75 years plus now. Uh, but at ACM, these are the things that we do. Uh, we have three programs running right now. We do weekly workshop on uh, technical workshop and professional level, a developing workshop. Uh, right now, we are focusing a lot on ACM projects where we are providing an opportunity. Uh, the student or literally anyone who has an idea, we give them funding, we give them membership, and they can feel whatever they want. That's what we are doing with ACM projects. Uh, ACM talks is the blockbuster of this year. We have two talks, uh, and we were able to bring some ACM distinguished speakers from outside, and that's just with their knowledge. Yeah, that's been very fun this year. Uh, ACM Research is a new program that we launched. Uh, it's basically acting as a bridge to connect all the labs that we have at ACM because if you're a freshman or if you're a sophomore or if you're looking for your first job, it's really hard to look for your first job, especially for research because we don't have one platform where you can see all the research. So this is what we are doing with this program. There was a little bit about it. And uh, yesterday we released our application for um, next year's offices we have 16 positions open so if you guys are interested to be a leader and get on this journey of uh, community service so please uh and if you are or you can just go to our instagram or anywhere you will find the application and tomorrow we have the council's engineering banquet so this uh hopefully will be the biggest and the banquet of this year that's happening at MSC, and we are sponsoring that. So I would like to invite all of you, any person who consider themselves an engineer, or even if you're not. <laughs> so please come to that. It's tomorrow, and we'll be MSC. Okay. Yeah.
that's it. And now you can all proceed to AMB 109. We have our AC folks over there. You can go talk to them, <laughs> know more about the club. If you're interested in running for any other position, uh, they are the best people to talk to right now. And uh, I'll see you over there. Thank you. Um, also, <laughs> for those who are online, joining us on YouTube, this is where we will be ending our live stream because right now we'll have uh, people who are in person having dinner. So, thank you so much for joining us online. And uh, this is potentially the, uh, so to say, end of DEF CON or the IWD. I thank you all who came here in person, and I hope you gained something out of this entire event. Uh, and yes, uh, a big, big shout out to everybody who was involved with, like, you know, making this uh, entire event a reality. That's Carol, that's Money, that's Nidhi, that's uh, Mikita. Big shout out to Mikita. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Thank <laughs> you.